This is the Rayburn House office building where Wednesday a hearing was held on federal debt collection. California Congressman Steve Horn, chairman of this government reform and oversight subcommittee, heard from officials from various government agencies, including the Treasury Department and Small Business and Social Security Administrations. The hearing lasts about an hour and 15 minutes. A quorum being present, uh, the Subcommittee on Government Management Information Technology will come to order. One and a half years ago, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996. This law changed the rules of the game for debt collection. Currently, the total of delinquent non-tax debts is $50 billion. By providing new collection tools to agencies and incentives to increase collections and accountability, Congress hoped to increase the dismal performance of the federal government in collecting delinquent debts. What results have been achieved so far? The Department of Treasury's Financial Management Service has spent between 20 and 30 million dollars implementing the Debt Collection Improvement Act. This involves coordinating with federal agencies, conducting awareness campaigns, drafting contracting documents and regulations, and working with agencies to refer their debts to the Treasury. The Financial Management Service has only collected $2.8 million from these efforts, while it is an improvement from the $300,000 collected in April as of our last hearing, it's not enough. The Department of Treasury is still not covering its costs. I hope that as we, as of our next hearing, six months from now, we have another improvement of at least one order of magnitude and ideally two. That would bring us to collect about 300 million per year. We should be collecting billions every year. Fifty million dollars is significant, but we ought to set our sights considerably higher. In order to get the real money and to begin collecting more than we spend, agencies need to implement three key provisions of the Debt Collection Improvement Act. Asset sales need to accelerate. The positive experiences of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the excellent returns they have had are eye-opening. Further asset sales can dramatically increase collections. Regulations must be drafted, published, and implemented. Several key authorities from the Debt Collection Improvement Act will continue to be unavailable to agencies until regulations are published. For example, wage garnishment, offset of benefit payments, and barring delinquent debtors from obtaining additional loans or benefits cannot be used as a collection tool unless these regulations are published. Would that it were otherwise. The committee is disappointed at the absence of the Office of Management and Budget today. Its staff worked hard to help pass the Debt Collection Improvement Act and has been helpful in various troubleshooting problems. Acting Deputy Director for Management Ed Deceive was unable to be with us. It is very important that the Office of Management and Budget focus agency attention on government-wide problems. Its slowness is another reason to advocate a separate Office of Management, which we will shortly be doing. At our last hearing, I questioned Mr. Deceive's predecessor, John Koskinen, about the level of support for this initiative at the Office of Management and Budget. He was unequivocal in stating the administration's support for improving debt collection. We hope the same message will be expressed by the Office of Management and Budget in both words and deeds in the near future. Ultimately, success will be measured by dollars collected and accounts resolved. That said, we welcome witnesses from several federal <coughs> agencies to discuss implementation of the Debt Collection Improvement Act. Although agencies are at varying stages in implementation, it's fair to say that everyone here can do better. And if there are additional laws you wish Congress to enact in this area, please let us know. I now yield to Ms. Maloney, the ranking Democrat on the committee, for an opening statement. I, I thank the chairman for yielding. And I am uh, very, very pleased that you're holding this oversight hearing on our Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996. I, too, am very concerned with implementing this bipartisan legislation in a timely manner. Although we don't have much to show for it, I firmly believe this legislation can dramatically improve the collection of delinquent debt throughout the government. 
However, the problem does not appear to be our legislation, but rather the federal agency's unwillingness to implement our legislation. Two years ago, I released a report showing that businesses and individuals owe the government $50 billion in past due debts. The federal agencies asked the Congress for additional tools and methods to improve collecting this debt. The chairman and I responded by delivering that legislation. We gave broad new powers to federal agencies to improve government-wide collections. Two years later, I have released today a second report that again shows $50 billion in delinquent debt. I feel, Mr. Chairman, like we are spinning our wheels. What has happened is that our Debt Collection Improvement Act, which became law in April 1996, has only collected $2.5 million out of the $50 billion in delinquent debt. That means in a year and a half, we've collected only $1 for every $20,000 that is owed. That is tremendously embarrassing. And when I look at these dollars, I see teachers, I see police officers, I see services that we be, could be giving the American public if we brought in these dollars. Today, I would like to focus on perhaps the two most important implemented uh, components of the legislation, the Administrative Offset Program and the cross-servicing program. As you know, the Department of Treasury is now testing the Grand Treasury Offset Program, which would implement the Administratively Offset Program. I have repeatedly asked for target dates for completion of this program. Since Treasury has not provided dates for me, I have put together my own suggested dates, and I would like to submit them in the record of proposed target dates so that we could implement this program and start collecting this money. Without objection, be in the record at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the administrative offset program and cross-servicing programs to work, the federal agencies must refer their debts to Treasury. So far, most have not. As a result, I have put together this report on agency compliance with the law. Agencies that have not referred debts for administrative offset or for the cross-servicing receive an F grade. Agencies that have referred debt for one or the other receive a D grade. Agencies that have referred some debts for both programs receive a C grade. Since no agency referred all their debt to Treasury, no one received an A. And I'd like to put this, uh, this uh, grading schedule on federal agencies into the record with the supportive documentation that supports these grades. Without objection, be in the record at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lastly, I would uh, want to mention uh, two pieces of legislation that will focus on curtailing waste, fraud, and abuse in federal benefit programs. My first bill, the Debt Collection Wage Information Act, would help locate delinquent debtors who move from one state to another to avoid paying their debt. I have estimated that this bill would bring in an additional $1 billion uh, per year if fully implemented. It has been implemented in, in uh, Massachusetts, and they testified earlier before the committee that it had been very, very successful in implementing uh, debt collection for their state. My second piece of legislation is the Federal Benefit Verification and Integrity Act of 1997. This bill would allow federal agencies to verify and confirm the accuracy of information provided by applicants of federal benefits. Using this common sense approach, Federal agencies can root out fraud and abuse before delivering the benefits. Uh, the chairman of this committee is a former professor, former head of a school, and I think he would uh, agree that uh, with a $50 billion out there and a $50 billion charge to go out and collect it, to bring in $2.5 million is um, embarrassing, to say the least. It's, it's really outrageous. I truly believe that if I were running this program in uh, Treasury, I could bring in at least $10 million uh, by falling off a log and just spending uh, a minor amount of my attention and time focusing on it. Um, if this was the private sector, if this was the private sector and they didn't collect the money that was owed to them, they would be out of business. They would be out of business. And we need to run government more like a business as we strive to balance the budget and continue to invest 
in education and other important areas in the environment and other areas that are important to our country. Again, I thank the chairman for his leadership. I thank the gentlewoman. And I now yield to a gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Would you like an opening statement? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank you for convening this hearing regarding the federal debt collection practices. I also want to thank our distinguished witnesses for taking time to share with us their expertise as it relates to this very touchy subject. This hearing focuses on the implementation of the Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996. The Act authorizes agencies to refer delinquent debt to the Treasury Department's Financial Management Service. The DCIA is important for several reasons. First, it strengthens the government's ability to collect delinquent non-tax debt by providing a number of tools for agencies to use. In addition, the Act requires federal agencies to transfer delinquent debt over 180 days old to the Treasury Department for collection. Interestingly, as we examine debt collection processes, we do so at a time when our economy is robust. And many in our nation are letting the good times roll in terms of spending. However, personal bankruptcies, student loan defaults, and foreclosures on homes and farms are seriously on the rise. In fact, over the last decade, delinquent debt has increased from $23.9 billion in 1985 to $48.8 billion in 1994. And in 1995 and 1996, the level rose to approximately $51 billion. It is my hope that this hearing will address the issue of why the DCIA has been little used to date. In addition, I look forward to hearing why only three of the 16 regulations needed to implement the DCIA have been made final. And finally, I'm interested in hearing what procedures and processes have been put in place to ensure due process rights of individuals whom the government will go after co to collect outstanding debt. Therefore, I look forward to hearing from this distinguished panel of witnesses and again, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for the leadership that you've taken in leading us towards, hopefully, some real resolution to a difficult problem. I thank you and yield back uh, the balance of my well, time. I thank the gentleman from Illinois for his kind comments. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Secretary Hawk, Mr. Secretary Murphy, you know the routine here. We swear all witnesses. After we introduce you, your full statement is automatically in the record. And we'd sort of like you to look us in the eye and speak off the cuff. But we will, in deference to your position and your leadership role, uh, we will give you all the time you need to get your statement out. So if you'll stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear a testimony you're about to give this subcommittee to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? The clerk will note both witnesses have affirmed the oath. And uh, Mr. Under Secretary Hawk, it's always a pleasure to have you back here. And uh, we know you're trying as best you can in some of these areas, and we'd appreciate your opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, the uh, and distinguished members of the committee, uh, let me say that I think that uh, the opening statements of the members of the committee have focused on exactly the right, uh, uh, right issues. Uh, this program uh, is one that is of tremendous importance. We are disappointed with uh, the progress uh, to date in implementing the program. We think that there are, there are some uh, reasonable explanations for that. We are continuing to make a strong effort to get the program uh, up and running, and uh, we share all the objectives that, uh, that the Committee and the Congress uh, have had in, in uh, passing this legislation and conducting these oversight uh, hearings. Uh, in April of this year, uh, Assistant Secretary Murphy and I testified before this subcommittee about the status of Treasury's effort to implement the Act. And we continue to make progress in, in, uh, in most areas, but uh, the progress has not been uh, what it should be or what it, uh, what it could be. And I, uh, I think I, I, we should be very frank and uh, forthright about that. The number of uh, delinquent debts uh, that has been uh, referred to us for uh, the offset program has increased. 
uh, it still, uh, again, is not uh, not what it uh, what it should be. Uh, the we have we've entered into uh, agreements with the agents with uh, with agencies for cross servicing uh, of debt, uh, and that needs to be uh, increased. Uh, so far, the amount of debt that's been put into the cross servicing uh, program is uh, is very very modest. We have awarded contracts to 10 private uh, collection agencies for the collection of delinquent debts, and we, we plan to move ahead uh, vigorously with uh, that part of the program. Um, let me just address uh, uh, three or four of the key issues that, uh, that the committee has uh, uh, expressed an interest in. First, one of the, one of the uh, significant uh, uh, shortfalls, I think, uh, up to date has been our inability to get the tax refund offset program merged into the Treasury uh, offset program. Uh, that has turned out to be uh, far more complicated than, than we had uh, uh, thought. The need to integrate the systems at, uh, at IRS and, uh, and FMS has been, uh, has been a challenge. Rather than move ahead with that on a basis where we might uh, be creating uh, implementation problems, and one must have in mind here the kind of experience that IRS has had uh, with, uh, with taxpayers, uh, stories that have been so prominent in, in, uh, in recent months. Uh, a decision was made to delay that uh, for one year, uh, and I think all things considered, uh, that, uh, that was a reasonable decision to make under the circumstances rather than moving ahead with uh, a program that might have such significant uh, flaws in it that it would it would threaten uh, public support uh, and, and congressional support for the for the entire program. Uh, we are we are moving ahead, and and uh, uh, I have not yet seen uh, uh, Mrs. Maloney's uh, suggested uh, uh, schedule for implementation. We're anxious to uh, to see that and to, and to give you our views on. Uh, on whether whether we can meet uh, the uh, uh, the goals that uh, that that uh, you're suggesting for us, uh, the the um, on the question of referral of debts, uh, I think the committee is uh, very cognizant of the fact that we can only collect in the offset program what uh, agencies have uh, have referred to us and. The, to date, only 17 agencies have referred delinquent non-tax debt to us for the uh, uh, offset program. Uh, in fairness, uh, we, we don't yet have uh, in the offset program all of the, uh, the payment files uh, from different agencies that are necessary to run, the, uh, run that program effectively. Uh, to date, uh, uh, we, uh, we essentially only have the, the um, OPM uh, retirement uh, retirement payments uh, and, and and vendor payments uh, in uh, in in that system. The the major payment programs have not yet been put into the system. So uh, there's been tardiness, I think, on uh, on both sides. Uh, we have been working with uh, uh, OMB to try to. Uh, stimulate uh, agency uh, participation in the process, and uh, uh, Mr. DeSev, I think, uh, has been particularly helpful in, in, in that regard in getting, uh, getting the message out. One of the uh, issues that the committee has focused attention on that I know is, a, uh, is frustrating for the committee and is frustrating for us is the, is the pace of implementing uh, regulations. Uh, there are a variety of different types of regulations that have to be put into place so that the, the, the system, when it's finally up and running fully, will be, uh, will be uh, uh, fully documented so that all participants in the system know exactly what the ground rules are. Uh, the process of developing and clearing regulations uh, it has been far more complex and, and uh, uh, burdensome than I think uh, we estimated uh, at, the, at the outset. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the number of levels of legal review that uh, regulations have to go through before they can get uh, uh, put in final form, the number of uh, uh, offices that have to sign off on regulations uh, uh, is, uh, is significant. We, we hope to be able to accelerate uh, that process, but uh, we have not, uh, uh, we haven't even met the projections that we 
uh, we set for ourselves uh, for putting implementing regulations in place. Uh, the, I should say that, uh, in fairness, the, the lack of uh, a fully fleshed out uh, uh, set of regulations has not been uh, the cause of, uh, of delay uh, in the program. We have put uh, interim regulations in place uh, and uh, the uh, and we're, we're pushing ahead with the task of getting regulations uh, uh, through the process so that they can be uh, put in place. Another issue I know that the, that the committee has been interested in is the question of uh, uh, the appointment of uh, program agencies as debt collection centers. And uh, we've done We've had a number of discussions about this at Treasury, uh, and uh, my view is that uh, any agency that uh, wants to be designated as a debt collection center should have a very high threshold of, uh, of uh, proof to uh, satisfy before uh, we should uh, uh, designate them as such. After all, we're dealing with a statute here that, was, uh, that reflects a perception on the part of Congress that agencies have not done a good enough job in collecting debts. Uh, and uh, we think that, that uh, before we sign off on uh, the appointment of an agency as a debt collection uh, center, they should make a, an extremely compelling case as to uh, why, that, uh, why that should be done and why the uh, process of collecting their delinquent debts should not be separated from them and put in, in uh, uh, third party hands as the, as the uh, act uh, uh, contemplates. Um, the, I know there are a number of other issues that the committee is uh, interested in. I, I will try to do my best to uh, answer the committee's questions. Uh, Mr. Murphy uh, will be here to answer uh, questions that involve a, a level of detail that I can't address. Uh, but I do want to say again, Mr. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Maloney and Mr. Davis, that, that uh, uh, we are not ignoring this statute. We think it's extremely important. We supported its, uh, its enactment. Uh, we believe it, uh, it's of tremendous importance to the integrity uh, of our uh, credit programs that uh, we make vigorous efforts to collect what's owed to the government. Uh, the, in, again, in fairness to the, to the program, I think uh, uh, we have to recognize the complexities involved of taking hundreds of millions of, uh, uh, of payments uh, that we make each year and matching them against uh, uh, lists of uh, delinquent debtors in a way that uh, both observes due process rights, avoids duplication, uh, and avoids the kind of uh, uh, horror stories that uh, we've seen in the context of, uh, uh, of the um, tax collection uh, program. Uh, we want to do this right. Uh, it's going to take more time than we had originally thought to, uh, to get it done right. We still think that there's a lot uh, uh, a, a lot of merit in, in the program, and we're going to continue to work hard at uh, achieving those objectives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, we thank uh, we thank you, Under Secretary Hawk. Let me just say, since the word offset has been used, some people will not understand what that is. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's the interception or withholding of a payment due to a delinquent debtor. You got a better uh, definition than that? Yes, I, I assume I, I think you that's, do. That's a good definition, Mr. Chairman. And, and what we really are doing, I. I hope, uh, I hope uh, everybody who looks at this program understands the complexity of this. We're, we're trying to take uh, computerized lists of, of, uh, of payments that the government makes, the, the, the hundreds of millions of payments that the government makes every, uh, every year, and match those against uh, uh, very large lists of debts that are owed to the government. That's a process that is going to be done by a, a complex uh, computer program. And if that program is not done carefully and tested carefully uh, before it's put into, into operation, we, we run a risk of, of um, creating the kind of chaos that could undermine uh, confidence in this whole program. Well, we thank you, Under Secretary Hawk. I take it you'll be able to remain with us because we have oh, yes. a number of questions. Uh, we now have the statement of Gerald Murphy, Fiscal Assistant Secretary. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'd just uh, like to elaborate a little bit on some of the items that Under Secretary Hawk mentioned. In the area of the Treasury Offset Program, we're running an interim system, as you know, 
and we're attempting to develop a new software designated GTOP, which will be much more robust and have capabilities that the current interim system does not have. We had originally intended to complete uh, the, the GTOP system and to merge it with the IRS tax refund offset system on January 1 of 1998. And when I testified before you last April, I was truly committed to making that happen. As we went along in that process, however, we started finding complexities that had not yet been resolved. And in essence, we were walking a tightrope without a safety net because we had to make a decision at some point as to whether the GTOP system could be brought up, whether all the interfaces with other FMS systems could be I, worked I, out. I might interrupt. Uh, I established about 50 things like GTOP in this wonderful bureaucratic testimony. Could you explain that as we go for the average listener, including members of Congress? That's the grand treasury offset approach. Now, it's tell it's us how it works. a more robust system that will enable us the primary thing that it will do is to enable us to put more payments into the matching process. As Mr. Hawk mentioned, at the moment we have basically OPM retirement and vendor payments that we're matching against the debts we have. With the more robust system, we will be adding salary payments in at a later point. We will be adding benefit payments in at a later point, and we'll be able to do a lot of the things that the, the interim system cannot do. Uh, for example, uh, some of the states are concerned in collecting child support through our interim uh, offset system that we don't have the capability of recognizing if there is a wage garnishment uh, already in place for an OPM retiree. And we can't identify that under the present system. Therefore, there's a risk that we may take a double hit if we offset one of those. The new system is supposed to be able to handle all of those kinds of things. Um, with those complexities, as Mr. Hawk mentioned, IRS and FMS jointly decided to defer the tax refund offset merger for one year. <clears throat> so that is now supposed to come up by January 1 of 99. Um, in some ways, um, you know, that puts us back a little bit. Uh, that slippage means that uh, other things have been affected. But we needed to focus on making the tax refund offset program work well, because that is a program that you know, is going to collect $1.75 billion, hopefully, in this coming year. And we had to make the decision uh, because we didn't want to risk a possible loss of that kind of revenue. We are going to get some benefit out of this transitional period, though, because this year we're going to use an entirely different process. In the past, agencies have been submitting uh, debts for offset to IRS under the tax refund offset program and separately transmitting debts to us for the interim offset treasury program. This year, they're all going to come in through the financial management service. So instead of having 17 agencies reporting debts for offset, we're going to have 40 agencies reporting debts to us that we can run through our Treasury offset program as well as the IRS tax refund program. So we expect to get a lot more debts into that program. Uh, as has been pointed out, uh, the cumulative collections under the Treasury offset program to date, uh, something over 790,000, um, not nearly what we want to have. But again, it's attributed to the fact that the interim system can only match against the OPM and the vendor payments. In the uh, area of cross-servicing, FMS has 24 letters of agreement with agencies. That's sort of our contract with the agency as to when they will refer debts for cross-servicing. We have uh, 29,000 cases at the moment with an excess of $460 million. 
And of those, we've collected uh, over a million dollars, 1.1 million dollars. Cumulatively, we've collected more through that cross-servicing. And we've also, it doesn't show up in the numbers yet as dollars actually receive, but we've also been able to uh, enter into repayment plans with some of the debtors that uh, cover an additional $2 million. That's gonna be paid in installments. There are also two key changes that we've adopted to make the offset program a little more efficient. Um, one, we're using an automated lockbox process now, which will do some electronic posting for us to eliminate some of the manual intensive work. And we're also accepting credit cards from debtors for some of the small payments, which again, we think will help us collect some additional amounts. Uh, Mr. Hawk mentioned the private collection agency contract. Uh, we have 10 contractors. Uh, those were awarded in September of this year. The contractors have 60 days to establish their systems compatibility to allow electronic transfer of the debt files between FMS and the contractors. We provided uh, instructions to the federal agencies and we'll be conducting a workshop with the agencies and the contract tours to uh, facilitate the use of the contract and answer any questions people have on implementing that particular tool. In the area of regulations, uh, the short answer, I guess, is that we've got three regs out, we've got three in clearance that we expect to be published within 30 days, and we're still working on four, as you pointed out. The, um, for the most part, um, we have been able to issue the regulations that needed to be out there in place that would have held something up. Um, and, but there are still these other areas that we definitely want to, uh, to get out. Um, in addition, yes. we're also gonna be trying to improve the reporting to the Congress on receivables. As you know, the DCIA transfer the responsibility for reporting uh, on receivables from OMB to Treasury. And last summer, the General Accounting Office came out and recommended some improvements in reporting We've convened uh, interagency task groups with agency representatives, and they're currently looking at uh, draft proposals. We would hope to get um, some new, better data to the Congress. Uh, we're hoping that this new uh, reporting arrangement could be in place by next June. Uh, depending on the agency system's capability to provide the data. One area that uh, Mr. Hawk just touched upon briefly is we do have a, an issue resolution plan with agencies who have been experiencing difficulties in meeting the requirements for offset and cross-servicing. And um, a meeting was hosted by Ed DeSeb of OMB in September. The agencies uh, came in Treasury participated. Uh, we identified their concerns and some of the uh, difficulties that they have been experiencing and uh, divided them up into three general categories. We've got a task group assigned to each one of those issue areas. And I think that process will result in a greater understanding uh, on the part of the agencies about the requirements and also on our part in terms of the difficulties that the agencies face. So we will be working very closely with them to try to resolve some of those issues. There, there has been progress made in some of these areas. Uh, however, as we noted, uh, and you certainly noted, that uh, we haven't made the headway that we had hoped. In some cases, we were perhaps overly optimistic in terms of target dates and underestimating the complexity of some of these issues, but we're not satisfied with the results to date and we'll be making every effort to get up the systems that will pro provide more revenue to the federal government. Uh, as you know, uh, Virginia Harder recently retired after 39 years in government 
Uh, she was the Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management Service. Uh, Mrs. Nancy Fleetwood has been appointed as the Interim Acting Assistant Commissioner, and she brings uh, some experience from being controller of the organization for several years, and she also has a strong background in systems <laughs> development. So we're confident that she will be providing strong leadership during this transitional period. Uh, we also have Commissioner Morris and Deputy Commissioner Smokovich, which will be continuing to remain active in the direction of the implementation of the program. And my office will continue to take an active oversight role to assure that things remain on track. And to that end, I've detailed Mr. Dave Liebrick, who was recently selected as Assistant Fiscal Assistant Secretary to assist FMS in the timely implementation of DCIA. Uh, with those efforts, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my summary and uh, would be happy to respond to any questions. Well, we thank you very much for that testimony. Uh, I think uh, you know that we have high regard for the Financial Management Service and its competence and efficiency within the Department of the Treasury. Uh, on these rounds, because of the complication of this subject, each member will have 10 minutes, and if we aren't done then, we'll go another round of 10 minutes each. Uh, let me open with this. Uh, we might as well start at home, your home. According to a recent Office of Management and Budget report, the non-tax debts of the Department of the Treasury are $513 million as the Treasury Department referred its own debt to Treasury's own offset program? I believe the answer to that, Mr. Chairman, is that some of it has and some of it has not. Uh, we do keep a, uh, a record. I don't think I have a copy, uh, but we have a uh, listing by bureau within the department, and uh, we'd be happy to furnish that for the record. Let, let me just get straight the reporting relationships. Mr. Murphy, as Assistant Secretary, reports to Under Secretary Hawk. To whom does Under Secretary Hawk report? To the Secretary. To directly to the Secretary. Yes. To whom does the Commissioner of Internal Revenue report? To the Secretary. All right. Both of you report to the Secretary. Uh, we haven't even gotten into the tax debt, which is what started me in this thing three years ago when I saw they had written off over $100 billion in debt, and that means the rest of us that pay our tax bills uh, are sort of shortchanged. And they told me, gee, we have $64 billion we can collect besides the $100 billion they'd written off. It didn't start with this administration. It started back in 1990 under the Bush administration, but it's greatly accelerated in what we say is uncollectible in this administration, as I told the then commissioner. And speaking of the commissioner, I think you've picked an excellent person, and the president has picked an excellent person to come in as commissioner. We had written him to say, please, no more outstanding accountants, no more outstanding economists, no more outstanding tax lawyers. Get somebody that's run a large organization. There's 102,000 employees at least in the Internal Revenue Service. And with that kind of debt that just goes unsought after, and it, it disturbs a lot of members of Congress, regardless of party. Nothing to do with party. This is like city management and picking up the garbage. It isn't Democratic or Republican. Just get it off the streets. And I think that's how Mrs. Maloney and I, Mr. Davis and Mr. Davis from Virginia on our side, feel about this. We've got to really focus in on it because the average taxpayer, and as you know, I usually hold a hearing on IRS on April 14th, and the average taxpayer gets very upset when they see they pay their taxes. How come these other people get away with not paying their taxes? And I know we have, thanks to Mr. Colby and uh, Ms. Johnson, who heads the Oversight Committee on Ways and Means, uh, we're waiting for them, really, to give us the authority. But uh, maybe we can go ahead in a lot of ways without their authority. And I guess I would ask, as the uh, Treasury Secretary, and yourself, Mr. Hawk, and the President ever thought of issuing an executive order to these other agencies to say, get with it, get that debt over to the Financial Management Service, and let's go pick it up. The President has full authority, I'm sure, to just tell his Cabinet officers, get going on this. Now, what is your answer to that? Mr. Chairman, I can't say that the, that the subject of an executive order as such has been considered, but I can tell you that uh, uh, in, during the time that I served on the President's Management Council, 
on at least three occasions. Uh, I brought this subject up uh, in the context of uh, meetings of all of the representatives of the agencies. Mr. DeSev has, uh, has communicated with the agencies at, at our urging, uh, and uh, we, have, we have tried to do uh, what we can in, in that regard. I think, Mr. Chairman, that, that uh, the, the, um, uh, we have to have realistic expectations about, uh, about uh, this, this program. And I think one of, the, one of the problems that we all have to uh, uh, come to grips with is the understandable concern about uh, program agencies uh, not wanting to uh, interfere with, uh, with their programs by, uh, by uh, being overly vigorous in the collection of debt. I, I spent uh, seven years uh, as the chairman of a major law firm, and one of the biggest problems uh, here in town, one of the biggest problems that we had uh, uh, in collecting uh, uh, delinquent uh, fees from clients was that, uh, that the lawyers who were in charge of those clients didn't want to offend their clients by engaging in vigorous uh, debt collection activity. And, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's kind of a natural uh, uh, human uh, uh, failing. I think the important thing is to separate de debt collection from uh, program responsibilities uh, and have an independent uh, authority. And that, that is the wisdom that's reflected in the Debt Collection uh, Improvement Act. Uh, in order to realize uh, that objective, it's important for the agencies to, to cut the cord and to refer those debts and to break the linkage between uh, uh, program responsibilities and debt collection responsibilities. I completely agree with you. If I were an agency head, I would love to have the debt collection move over to Treasury. You be the bad people, and the agency can happily go on pandering to the special interests that agencies reflect around this town. Let me just say on that uh, experiment we're having with IRS, uh, one of those packages they put out to bid had five-year-old debt. Now, my suspicious mind said, gee, are they trying to make this system fail? What have you heard on that front? I, I think the, the, the point that's implicit in your question, Mr. Chairman, is, is absolutely right. The older debt becomes, the more difficult it is to collect. The number that uh, has been used uh, uh, as sort of the baseline of uh, federal debt, $51 billion, uh, is uh, a number that deserves some some uh, uh, examination. Over we calculate that over 87 percent of that amount is uh, debt that's been outstanding and delinquent for over a year. And I think, as everybody involved in this business knows, uh, once debt is outstanding for more than a year, it uh, it becomes, in many cases, more and more difficult to collect. A private standard uh, may suggest that. Uh, uh, only seven or eight percent of debt that's that old is is really collectible. So I think I think we need to look carefully at the numbers. Of course, in the case of student loans, uh, there may be something of the opposite. The, the longer the debt is outstanding, the the, the more able the, the debtor may become to to pay the debt. So we can't uh, overly generalize about that. But uh, of that 51 billion uh, in in, out, in outstanding debt, uh, there may there may be as much as um, uh, 44, 45 billion that, that uh, is over a year uh, outstanding. And if 7% of that was collectible, that means that we're only talking about 3 or $4 billion uh, of, that, uh, uh, of that number that uh, is, is real, that, that uh, amount over a year is delinquent, is really, uh, is really collectible. Well, I agree on the student's ability to pay. But the fact is, when you don't follow up, and this is what I told the commissioner that was in office three or four years ago, you're not organized to collect the debts. They don't make the phone calls on time. And pretty soon everybody thinks in IRS that, oh, this is a grant. What, what debt? What do you mean? What do I owe? Uh, and students feel the same way. Uh, they need good counseling. And I must say, starting with President Carter, we finally uh, got people in the Department of Education that started saying, what are you doing in universities, what are you doing in the banks to really counsel students that this is a loan, this is not a grant, it's not the Pell Grant. And uh, that's what uh, concerns me. And for the 51.3 billion delinquent non-tax debt, of which we have 513 million in the Treasury, 
you could almost start overnight if Secretary Rubin issued an executive order and said, get it over to the Financial Management Service. Now, one of the things we pointed out to the then commissioner, and I'll point out to the new commissioner, but I'm sure he knows the obvious, and the obvious is there are private debt collectors in this United States that collect debt. And why are we fussing around not collecting it? And why don't we auction that, those packages off and see what people can do? Well, we have, as I stated in my testimony, uh, completed a procurement uh, and, and have engaged 10 uh, private debt collecting firms of, uh, with nationwide capacity. Is, uh, is this one of these with the five-year-old debt in the package? That bothered me. If this comes out of the appropriations language, which three of us urged, why this is separate from that, I take it, Mr. Brasher tells yes. me. Yes. Yeah, what has been referred in essence? In it terms was just of debt, awarded September 30, uh, and as I mentioned, the contractors have 60 days to demonstrate that they can connect with us to exchange the debt uh, electronically, uh, and then another 30 days for a, a test. Uh, that should be up, and they should be operational February 1. Uh, yes, February 1. The old GSA debt collection contract I think expires January 31st. I notice, uh, Secretary Murphy, on page two of your testimony, you say we discussed the agreement uh, between the Financial Management Service, the Internal Revenue Service, to merge the tax refund offset program uh, into uh, your uh, Treasury offset program and your work with Health and Human Services to develop procedures to include past due child support debts in the offset process. Now, past due child support debts, I think, ought to be a fairly easy thing to get ahead of. Uh, Commissioner Adams, Commissioner of Revenue in Massachusetts, told me the uh, day the law took effect that that gave him the power to raise millions of dollars in unpaid child support that had been uh, specified by the courts of Massachusetts. When people go over the state line, he could access now the tapes on uh, where are people working and all the rest of it. And I just wonder, why the federal side, which it ought to be fairly easy to put a garnishment or anything else on or a lien, uh, why the federal side doesn't seem to be moving ahead on these deadbeat dads child support situations? What's happening? Uh, basically, the, uh, the states have been participating for a number of years in the IRS tax refund offset program. And uh, last year, they collected over a billion dollars in offsets against tax refunds. Um, we just started working with the states uh, back in June. The first few states uh, entered into the interim Treasury offset program. Uh, we've, we've talked with all 50 states. Uh, at the moment, there were, this year, there's been nine who were participating in uh, the interim offset system. Uh, one or possibly two may withdraw. Uh, because they weren't collecting that much because of the limited number of payments that we have in that system to match against and for the technical reasons I mentioned earlier about not being able to detect a garnishment and the possibility of a double hit. Um, but essentially that program is going to take off again when the GTOP system comes up and we have more federal payments in that matching process to match against all those debts. Uh, the states submit uh, something like $34 billion in, uh, in delinquent child support debts to the IRS for offset. Uh, as I mentioned, they collected over a billion. Uh, but those debts could go into the Treasury offset system too. But the ta IRS tax refund program, that, that's sort of mandatory participation. Uh, with our system, it's voluntary. And the states have to make their own determination as to how much it would cost them to change systems, to participate, and how much they expect to get out of it. So it's, it's building, but uh, uh, it will really pay off when we have the full robust system. Thank you. My time is up. I uh, yield 10 minutes to Ms. Maloney, the ranking Democrat. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, unfortunately, even though Treasury is one of my favorite departments, um, and I think you do a good job on a lot of things. Unfortunately, Treasury got an F in our report uh, based really on lack of leadership and lack of making this a priority. In our questionnaire to Treasury, they didn't even answer the question on uh, the GTOP area and cross-referencing. 
I'd, I'd like to put this uh, chart in the record, and it, and it shows really very simply where we are, that $50 billion is owed, roughly $40 billion is over 180 days old, meaning according to the law it should have been referred to Treasury, yet only uh, $9 billion uh, was referred to the Treasury Offset Program, and only $727, uh, was re $727 million was referred to Treasury. It's no wonder that we collected only $2.5 million. The two major components of the law have not been implemented at all. And I'd just uh, like to respectfully respond to some of uh, Mr. Hawke's uh, comments. Um, earlier you said that uh, it was important to uh, most people didn't want to interfere, interfere with their programmatic work, and I agree. That's why we put into place a referral to Treasury, whose mission it is to bring money into the Treasury. That's the prime mission of the Treasury Department. Educators want to educate people. Uh, the Agricultural Department wants to uh, uh, support more uh, farmers and more growth in the farming industry. But Treasury is supposed to bring the revenues into the Treasury. And I must uh, note that our report does not touch tax revenues. This is all non-tax delinquent debt. And there was a mention earlier that a lot of this debt was old. In the law now, the, the uh, departments can write off old debt that they deem uncollectible. And one of the goals of our legislation was for Treasury to come forward with some guidelines that gave some type of unified direction for writing off debt. If something is uncollectible, ask the agencies and have them write it off. But right now, I would really like to address my, uh, my comments to Mr. Murphy, who really has more of the on-hands uh, direct responsibility for the implementation of the program. And one of the things that I'm having difficulty understanding with the implementation of the Treasury Department's Grand Treasury Offset Program, which is absolutely critical to improving debt. You cannot improve debt collection until you implement this program. And unfortunately, Mr. Murphy, you missed a great opportunity to merge um, uh, this program with the, um, with the tax refund offset program. And I have been told that the FMS contractor for the, for the offset program, the Treasury offset program, delivered the product, completed. He completed his work on schedule last month. Why then was there a decision to, de to delay implementing the Treasury Offset Program. We cannot implement this law until we implement the Treasury Offset Program. And, and I'd like to hear again why we have, are not moving forward. If you have a job to do, you get it done. If you don't want to do the job, you, sh you push it off in the corner, and that's what you've done by announcing that you're going to put off implementation for a year. The, um, it's true that the contractor delivered uh, a software package to us the end of October. Um, that system, however, now needs to be tested. And that is going to take some time. And we also have to be sure that that system is going to be able to interface with the other systems in FMS and with the systems in IRS. Uh, I can't give you a timeline on that yet. That is something that uh, we are working on, and in our response to Chairman Horn, our November 3 letter, we indicated that as soon as we develop that revised schedule, we will certainly share it with you. Uh, but that is a complicated process, and I, I don't, you know, I, I agree with your main point. Uh, we missed an opportunity, but in retrospect, uh, I believe very firmly that that was a good decision. Uh, I think we would have, uh, without having a system fully tested before going into that January conversion, I think we really would have put a lot of those tax refunds at risk. Well, well, I disagree. I think it was a very bad decision, and I think it was one that showed that you don't put debt collection on a high priority in your agency. And I simply do not understand how there could be a negative impact. Uh, FMS would have had ample time to test the program, and in the unlikely event that the, the, the merger failed, you could easily go back to the old system. In addition, you'd have the opportunity to learn from your mistakes. I don't see how the tax refund offset <coughs> program would suffer. I really uh, fail to see that. I feel that this was a delay tactic, 
and I would like to ask in writing for you to submit to the record how the tax refund offset program would suffer if you went forward with the merger and the testing. Uh, you know, a lot of times when, we, when we're in government or in any job, you don't have the absolute perfect solution sitting in front of you. But you're certainly not going to go forward if you don't try, if you don't test, if you don't try to complete it. And by putting it off, you just shunted it off in the corner. You could have started testing it. If it didn't work, then go back to the old system. And I would like to say that the, the failure of the tax uh, refund offset merger is no reason to delay the implementation of the uh, tax offset program. And it's been a year and a half since this bill passed, and I still haven't seen uh, target dates coming out of your office, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Horn and I wrote you in September asking again for target dates very respectfully. I would like to put again in the record, Mr. Chairman, our joint letter to Mr. Murphy requesting target dates of when you were going to implement this. And since you have not come back with target dates, Without I would, objection, the letter be put I would like point. to put forward suggested target dates. And if you can't meet these target dates, then let us know what you think should be the target dates. And we are saying that testing, or at least I'm saying, testing by the Federal Reserve Board by February of 98, conversion from the, from the intermediate, uh, uh, you know, a program ITOP <laughs> to the Grand Treasury uh, Offset Program by March of 98, and, and implementation by March um, of 98 too. And uh, can, you, can you comment or commit the Treasury to meet these deadlines? At this point in time, I cannot uh, commit to meeting those specific dates. Uh, we will, though, be happy to provide you with any written response to your question. Uh, the, the one uh, area which we may be perceiving a little differently, uh, I too was initially of the opinion that we could wait right up until the last minute to make a decision as to whether to go or no go on the merger. Uh, assuming that we could always fall back to the, the system that IRS has run for years. Uh, I turned out to be mistaken about that. And a uh, decision had to be made much earlier as to whether IRS was going to work on programming for the new system or to program to keep the old system going. And as a result of that, that's why I described it as we were walking a tightrope without a safety net. Uh, we didn't have a fallback, and the risk was just too great. Uh, and in retrospect, given, you know, where we are today, I, I think it was a good decision. But I uh, would be happy to provide uh, something for the record to you. But Without I, objection, it will be put in the record at this point. Thank you. I've been told uh, that the Federal Reserve Board will have another group test for the uh, Grand Treasury Offset Program. And I've heard that the Treasury Control Service staff are, are working only part-time on this effort. And, and uh, I have been told that, that if it were a priority in Treasury, then many of the problems that you, that you say are there would go away if you put the personnel and effort and focus on trying to accomplish it. Mrs. Maloney, it, um, we, sh we share, believe me, we share your uh, devotion to getting this program uh, up, and r up and running. Uh, as with all programs, uh, there are competing claims for resources of uh, agencies. We are trying to implement the electronic funds transfer provisions of the Debt Collection Act. Uh, but uh, th there's, no, there's no excuse for uh, unreasonable uh, delay. We don't think the delay uh, has reached uh, the level of unreasonableness at this stage. The, the, I, I do want to say, though, that, that I think the, the decision to delay um, uh, the uh, combination of the tax refund offset program was, was a, uh, a responsible one. Uh, this is not, these are exceedingly complex computer systems that we're talking about. And, and the idea that we could simply merge them in, uh, without adequate testing uh, and retreat to the older uh, model if, uh, if it didn't work, uh, I don't think really would be, a, a, realistically would be a good way to go. Just imagine, for example, if, <clears throat> if the systems didn't mesh properly and we, we found that uh, taxpayers were having their tax refunds offset uh, at the same time as other federal payments were being offset for the same debt. Uh, the kind of clamor that would arise uh, uh, in that situation would be, uh, would be similar to the kinds of uh, complaints that taxpayers have made about IRS collection uh, 
uh, methods and would run the risk of undermining uh, the, the basic uh, public and political support for this uh, entire program. I think it's much more important for the, for the long-range health and success of this program that we go about this prudently and carefully and make sure that we've got uh, systems that are reliable in place before we start implementing them. But they haven't even started testing them. I will say the electronic funds transfer, which was under your realm, is being implemented, and I congratulate you for that. But to, to make the Treasury offset program work, <coughs> Uh, the Treasury Department has to have an adequate payment file. Again, we have no target dates for the various payment files. As a result, uh, Mr. Murphy, I'd like to provide you with suggested uh, uh, target dates for the federal uh, salary offset. Now, that's simple. We should have a s why in the world should federal employees uh, uh, get away with not paying the debts that they owe the federal government? I'm suggesting by March of 98 that we should have that payment file in place. And the non-Treasury dispersing offices, that of Postal and the Department of Defense by March of 98, and the Social Security and the, and the Retirement uh, Railroad Fund by uh, June of 98, I think they're reasonable. Um, we were serious about this bill, and even in, in your comment, Mr. Hawk, that maybe not all of this is, you're able to, to collect it, but even if you brought in 10 percent, that's $4 billion. To me, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that could be used for uh, police officers, school teachers, uh, for daycare providers, for environmental, uh, environmental protection efforts. So, uh, so I just would like to ask Mr. Murphy, in those three areas, uh, since you didn't reply to our letter, do you think that they, Treasury, could meet those deadlines? Uh, again, with all due respect, it's all part of the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, those payments will be scheduled in you know, to the GTOP system. So it's, we have to test that system, we have to make sure the interfaces are there, and then we will be scheduling implementation of the addition of salary payments and benefit payments and the like. Um, the, uh, the salary payments, I, I would just mention, there is a separate salary offset process that has been in existence for a number of years. So federal employees aren't getting away scot-free, uh, but we haven't brought this into the Treasury offset program yet. But I've just uh, been told that a lot of the, the states are pulling their child support uh, debts out of the Treasury offset program because so few payments are currently being matched against the debts. And you could argue that this is a state issue, but to the extent that we are federally uh, sending funds to states for uh, welfare and other child support programs, uh, we certainly need and have a federal responsibility to help states uh, implement this. Mr. Chairman, uh, at the uh, risk of, of, of burdening the committee's time, I just wanted to make one, one other point. I, I think it's really important to have a realistic uh, assessment of what this program is, is all about. We've got $51 billion in unpaid debt to the federal government. Not all of that debt uh, is, is owed by people who are recipients of federal payments. The, the overwhelming number of regular payments that the federal government makes are retirement and benefit uh, uh, payments, salary payments and vendor payments uh, also uh, figure into the mix. Uh, but it's not, I, I think the public should understand that that, that 51 billion is not uh, uh, perfectly matchable against the universe of, uh, of federal payees. There are, there are millions and millions of people out there who owe the federal government money who will never get into the offset program because they're not, uh, uh, they're not getting federal payments that uh, we can offset against. That's, that's, that's an important point to recognize. Also, you raised a question earlier about the, uh, about the child support program. This is one that we, uh, that we have put a tremendous amount of, uh, of energy uh, into. But once again, I think it's important to recognize, uh, the, the, in a sense, the mismatch between what's owed and, and what's being paid. Uh, the, again, the, the overwhelming number of federal payments are Social Security benefit payments, retirement payments, uh, and, and the like. Uh, those are not necessarily, that's not necessarily the same population of people who are subject to child support uh, payments. They tend to be the, uh, the older uh, segment of the, uh, uh, of the population. So while, we, while the offset programs hold out the hope of, of bringing people uh, in and getting, uh, getting collections from uh, uh, people who are federal payees, uh, we, have, we have to be realistic about the extent to which there really is going to be a matchup. 
uh, my time is up and we have to move, but, but very, brief, very seconds. briefly, the offset program is a tool to bring in revenues that's owed the federal government. And many people abuse the system, as we well know. And there's no reason why we cannot move forward to implement and put into effect this tool so that we don't continue giving loans, royalties, fines, fees to people who are abusing the system. Do we agree with that? Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hawk, I, I happen to believe that one of the biggest obstacles to implementing the program is to get the agencies to comply with the 180-day cross-servicing requirement. We've indicated that compliance has not been as great as we'd like to see it. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations in relationship to how we could convince the agencies to, to comply with this requirement in a better way than what they've done? Well, the, the number that, uh, the current number for the amount that has been referred is 17, uh, 17 billion uh, dollars. Uh, and the, uh, the um, uh, as I said, uh, Mr. Davis, we have, we have tried through interagency mechanisms and through uh, OMB to, uh, uh, to try to accelerate the, the pace of, uh, of referrals uh, from the program agencies. Uh, the, uh, the chairman suggested uh, that, uh, that, that an executive order uh, be, uh, be considered, and, and certainly that's something that uh, uh, is, uh, is worthy of consideration. But I think the important thing here is that, the, that all of the participants in this program have to recognize uh, the importance of separating the debt collection function from the program function and uh, centralizing that, uh, that process and using uh, the, the ability to, to match up uh, federal payees with, uh, with uh, delinquent uh, debtors. It's going to be in everybody's interest to, uh, uh, to get uh, debts transferred, and I think, I think the agencies have to have to really be the first, uh, first line of defense. Even perhaps short of an executive order, is there any individual or group of individuals or task group or task force that has been designated by the administration perhaps to really spearhead implementation, to really shepherd this uh, program implementation that you aware of? There are a couple of groups, uh, the CFO Council and the Federal Credit Policy Working Group, who have been dealing with related issues. Um, Treasury has the leadership responsibility, and uh, we need to do more. Uh, OMB has also participated in trying to resolve some of the issues that agencies have. Uh, a lot of them are technical issues. Their systems capability, resource issues, uh, and we're dealing with those. As I, I mentioned, we've got uh, agencies have identified problems that they have, and we have a task group set up to address each of these three areas. We're hoping that some of that will remove you know, some roadblocks and help us move forward a little faster. Maybe as a result of the uh, technical complexity of the problem and what we're dealing with, I'd probably be in agreement with the chairman that perhaps we, we would seek the president to issue an executive order that uh, would provide a different level of leadership and perhaps a, a different level of concern across the board that might help to sp speed things up and, and make sure that the agencies recognize this as a priority as opposed to something that we kind of do after we've done some other things. But let me ask, uh, you indicated that we had engaged 10 private contractors to be involved in, in, in the process. Are the contracts structured in such a way that uh, their payment will come as a result of their effectiveness? Yes, sir. That's correct. And so there are incentives and bonuses and 
all of those things that sometimes you do in order to make sure that people work as hard as they can right. or as effectively as they can, as strategically as they can to, to get the job done. Yes, sir. Strictly an incentive basis. Could we get a, a, a list of those for the record in terms of who those companies are? And Certainly. And I would appreciate provide. that. Um, we've talked about the technical difficulty of merging, of integrating, of getting the systems all together and in place. Is there any new technology or different technology that is needed that we don't currently have that perhaps would be helpful in, in the process? I'm not aware of anything offhand um, that, you know, isn't either available or being planned. And so we, we, equipment and technology is not a issue, is not a problem, or is not perceived to be, and we, we think that we've got that. Well, there, there is a healthy investment in, you know, equipment and systems to, to make these things work, of course. Um, adding tax debt, for example, uh, under a continuous tax levy program sometime in the future is going to have a, uh, a very large implication on uh, the capacity of the systems needed to, uh, to handle all the types of debts that we'll try to collect. I know that private agencies are oftentimes more effective at debt collection than any other sources that, that, that we've encountered. Have you encountered or heard of any difficulty with any of the agencies in terms of heavy-handed tactics or in terms of overbearing tactics of dealing with individuals to whom they're trying to collect from? Personally, I am not. Uh, I think the the contract that, you know, previous contracts that have been let and uh, the current one, which we've just awarded, spell out, you know, pretty clearly what the contractors can do. Uh, and so I'm not aware of any egregious violations. Of, or so we have built into the contract protection for the individuals to whom we're going to be trying to extract uh, payment from? I think we have, you know, attempted to uh, protect the rights of debtors in, in all areas that we've been working on. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, part of that may be perception. Uh, a person who owes money and is unable to pay may view it as harassment when they get a letter from us or they get contacted by a private collector. Uh, but I'm not aware of any real, you know, the type of violations of inappropriate behavior, uh, which I think is the point of your question. Do we have safeguards? Uh, oftentimes, of course, people have the same names and very similar names. And I've known people to get kind of tied up and hung up because they were mistaken for their father or their father was mistaken for them or they were mistaken for somebody else who was Danny K. Davis, and they just went through lots of changes to try and get that resolved. And, and I would assume that these kind of discussions took place in the negotiations and as part of, of, of the requirements to protect, again, the, the rights of individuals and not violate those uh, the way sometimes we've seen. Then I thank you very much, and I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman, at this moment. Well, we thank you very much. Uh, I yield myself 10 minutes uh, to uh, round up a few questions here, and then Ms. Maloney will be next. Uh, Under Secretary Hawk, I'm curious. As I recall, the authorizing committee for the Department of Education gave them the authority to use administrative wage garnishments to collect debts and it was using the authority shortly after enactment 
and it didn't require any regulations. Now, the Garnishment Authority in the Debt Collection Improvement Act has seen to languish unused for nearly two years awaiting regulations. And uh, do we really need regulations? Did the Department of Justice insist that you issue regulations? Just where are we on that? I can't speak to the other agencies' programs, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I do know that uh, uh, the lawyers think it's important to have, uh, uh, have regulations in effect when, when you're doing things like, uh, uh, like uh, wage garnishment. Uh, the, the potential for litigation uh, uh, is significant in these situations, and not having a set of regulations uh, against which agency conduct can be measured uh, I think would probably be uh, uh, a, sig a significant uh, exposure in the program. Now, if I remember cabinet departments, the gen general counsel's office and the general counsel usually reports directly to the secretary or the deputy secretary, the undersecretary, uh, they're the ones that prepare these regulations. Now, do you have any of the general counsel staff physically uh, officed with, say, the financial management service? Or do you strictly have to beg, borrow, and heaven knows what out of the general counsel of the Treasury? Because I can't understand why this can't be done in a weekend, very frankly, if people are serious about it. Uh, FMS I, I don't say it's a usual routine. We write laws here sometimes in 24 hours, and they're pretty good ones. And we get them passed. But uh, what's, what's the problem here? FMS does have its own cadre of lawyers uh, that, that uh, report to the uh, general counsel of the uh, of the department uh, as a whole. Yeah, uh, they don't report to you or they don't report to FMS, right? They report to the general counsel. I, I, I suspect that they, they really have kind of dual reporting requirements. As in their legal work, they report to the, they're responsible to the general counsel of the department. They're, they're employed at, uh, at FMS. Yeah. When you recently uh, sent up your strategic plans in this area, uh, did you make any proposals where you'd get better legal service and faster legal service than you seem to be getting? I can't answer that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'd sure suggest you look at it, because uh, if it's just a few lawyers that can't seem to draft something very rapidly, this law now has been on the books uh, two years. And uh, it was before that we had a lot of help out of the chief financial officers. Everybody knew this was coming. And I can only speak for the Eisenhower administration when I was in a cabinet department. When we saw that law coming, we put our lawyers to work all during the uh, implementation of any law. And we were ready to go when things, uh, when it finally was signed by the president. Mr. And Chairman, uh, let me just correct one point that I made. Uh, I've just handed a note that the, the Debt Collection Improvement Act apparently does require that regulations be published concerning uh, the uh, administrative wage garnishment uh, uh, tool, and a proposed rule has been drafted and is in the clearance process now. And does that mean it's going out in the Federal Register? Uh, well, it, it will as soon as it finishes the internal clearance process. When do you think that will be? Do we, have a we were expecting uh, those three that have already gone through the clearance or in clearance to be out within 30 days. Uh, we've been optimistic before and wrong. But I think that's a reasonable uh, time frame. Uh, as you know, the President made a radio address once on child support. Uh, we all agree with that. And I would think with the President taking to the airwaves saying he wanted the federal government to do something about that, that that one ought to also be right at the top of the priority list. And if it's HHS that's failing to issue those regulations, uh, then uh, Treasury ought to be giving them a nod or take over the whole function. In fact, that's where I'm leading to. I, I don't understand, as we said earlier, if you were a cabinet officer, I think they'd be wonderful to get out the awful things you've got to do to some of the clientele, stick them over in Treasury where they can confuse it with IRS collecting, since it's Treasury collecting, and maybe just the letterhead alone might get a few dollars in here. That, that's, that point is, uh, is right on the mark, Mr. Chairman. We, we have found that uh, that when l collection letters go out on Treasury letterhead, they get, uh, they, they tend they to get, get serious. Uh, attention. Right. Uh, and I, I notice in the HUD testimony, they want to offer you a center in Seattle. Now, is anybody looking at that to have you take over their uh, fiscal processing center in terms of collecting debts? And they've got billions of them. 
uh, in HUD. Uh, is that underway? Is it uh, there has been discussions uh, between the staffs on that proposal. Uh, Treasury's made no decision on it as yet. I believe another meeting is scheduled with HUD for later this month. Yeah. Now, on the interim regulations that are in place allowing agencies to use all available debt collection tools, do those interim regulations include wage garnishment? I'm not sure I understand your question. The well, as I understand it, you've got some interim regulations out there. And I assume somebody signed off on it. Maybe I misread your testimony. But uh, the question is, does that include wage garnishment, or is that some separate that regulation? That is a separate regulation. That's uh, the wage garnishment uh, is um, the one that's in clearance now and that we would expect to go out within 30 days as a notice of proposed rulemaking. OK, so that would go out uh, as notice only by Christmas. And then it would be take effect end of January, or what? Um, it would probably take effect uh, about four months later. That will be about the time our hearing is going to be held again, saying, what have you done? Uh, we, we've I, got March 98 here. I, I hope it's done by then, sir. Yeah. And, and it just seems to me that uh, if the lawyers are dragging their feet, you headed a law firm, you know what can happen. Those are billable hours, presumably, in law firms when they drag their feet. This is wasting the taxpayers' time when they drag their feet in agencies. So uh, maybe you can, uh, with your legal skills from the private sector, confront the general counsel and say you've got a few angry members of the Congress here that wonder why we aren't doing more. And if it's because of regulations not being issued, I've got to ask the question. The president goes on the air and says he wants to do something about deadbeat dads, all of which Ms. Maloney and I concur in. And so I remember Commissioner Adams uh, phoning me, as I mentioned earlier, the day the law took effect. He said, your law has made my day. I'm going to collect millions in this area. So go to Massachusetts and find out how they do it, because they're doing it. And uh, I think all of us want that done. It's a good thing. I think the president must want it done. And uh, as I say, an executive order ought to be what the Secretary of the Treasury is presenting him with, clearing it through OMB. Let's get the show on the road. I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, that, that, uh, that the Deadbeat Dads uh, program has been given uh, very high level consideration within the Treasury Department. W once again, I, I just want to sound a, 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 a cautionary note about being real realistic about what the potential is here. The extent to which we can get child support payments uh, 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 enforced against a population of hundreds of millions of, of uh, Social Security annuitants and, and federal retirees is, is something of a question. They aren't necessarily the same people who have child support uh, uh, obligations outstanding. Uh, ten minutes to Ms. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first I'd like to follow up really with a very important point that my colleague Mr. Davis brought up, and that is to underscore that our legislation, which was supported by Treasury, uh, called for full due process and includes full due process. And if someone is, is contacted and it's a wrong contact, then the debt collector would be notified immediately. And there are total repayment uh, programs in place, particularly in the Department of Education, Many young people cannot afford to, to pay back their debts at certain times. This goes into consideration. Our bill is aimed at those that are truly deadbeats, that have uh, taken a loan or a payment from the federal government and has abused that, that payment. And I just wanted to make that very clear. And also our bill only applies to non-tax delinquent revenue. This is not uh, personal taxes of people. This is non-tax delinquent revenue fine fees, debts, loans that were given to individuals that they then refused to pay back. And I'd just uh, like to ask uh, Mr. Murphy, how many people are you now testing the Treasury Offset Program? Are you testing it now? I believe it was just received October 31st. Uh, so it's, it's been so recently that uh, I can't tell you whether someone is actually beginning to test or not, but that will begin shortly if it hasn't already. And uh, 
So it will begin testing. And how many people will you have working on testing the program? Uh, I don't have those numbers. I'd be happy to provide something to the re for the record if you care to. And the other program we were talking about, the Treasury Control Service, will they uh, be working on this effort too? I don't know how it's going to break down. Um, there, you know, where the original plan was to, um, you know, either have in-house testing or the Federal Reserve or some combination, and uh, I haven't uh, been briefed on what final conclusion has been made there. Could you get that back to us? Um, Certainly. Because I've been told the Federal Reserve is already testing it and that the Treasury Control Service is not testing it, and this is a resource that we could use that might be helpful to you. And um, I, I really wonder why, at the very least, uh, salary payments were not added to the Treasury Offset Program. That seems like it would be easy to do. Uh, that program currently is operating through the Office of Personnel Management. And it was a, sort of a standalone offset program, one of a number that But we our had. bill centralized it into the Debt Collection Act. That's and, correct. And added greater authority and power to it right. so that we're not reinventing the wheel, we're not duplicating. It appears that that would be a very easy item to add. Uh, do you have an idea of how long it would take to add uh, salary payments to the Treasury Offset Program? We're not planning to try to add it to this interim offset program, uh, which you know was not developed for it. But that will be phased in, you know, in our schedule to bring up the GTOP system. Could you let us know when you think you can add salary payments from the federal employees to the system? That will be included in the schedule. You mentioned in your your testimony the issue resolution plan. To, to improve the referral of debts to Treasury from other agencies. And as we noted in our report, uh, there has not been much follow-up from the agencies. And will you have specific target dates for when agencies will begin to comply with the law and refer debts to Treasury? Yes, that is part of the process of entering into the uh, letter agreements with the various departments. Uh, you know, the departments had to go through some preliminary stages, uh, issuing regulations and notices and the like, uh, and they confirmed to us that they have met those requirements, and then we sit down and negotiate a date for when they will actually be referring. We have, uh, I think it was 24 letter agreements at the moment. We still don't have agreements with a number of other agencies. The law said after 180 days, and I had, to, I had to work with the chairman on that. He wanted 30 days, I think, he was, uh, uh, to have it referred to Treasury. After 180 days, it would be referred to Treasury. And, and still, we have very, very few people complying with this. And uh, it seems to me like it's simple. You have debt. You have 180 days to bring it in. All of us know that it's easier to bring new debt in as opposed to old debt, as Mr. Hawk pointed out. So uh, what are you doing? The agencies have 180 days. They should be told, bring it in 180 days. If you can't bring it in, then send it to us. What is the letter agreement? I mean, it seems very clear in the law. After 180 days, it goes to Treasury. And, and I, I don't understand what the letter agreement is about. Are you, are you doing exemptions to the law? What is the letter agreement that then gives them more time? As you know from the report, where's that graph we had? Uh, very few people, where's that graph that the one that we had. Uh, no. Anyway. <laughs> I'll find it one of these days. But it seems to me very Whatever easy. You find it will be in the record okay. at this point. Here, here it is. I think that this clearly shows it. You know, you, you bring in 2.5 million because the two major components of our law have not been implemented. And it appears that the easiest, that of just referring to Treasury, you've only referred uh, or achieved in, in referring $727 million. And, and, you know, I, I fail to understand what is in the letter agreement that does it give them more time to refer to Treasury? I mean, it's strictly a date by which the agencies say that they will have the capability to provide 
all of this information to us. Uh, you know, if we were dealing with a handful of debts, you could just walk them across the street and give them to us. Uh, when you're talking about large volumes, you're talking about systems needed to transmit data electronically and to get data back electronically to update all your accounts and keep your record straight. Uh, so it's, it's those kind of systems issues, uh, in identifying the TIN numbers for each person, uh, meeting the format requirements for computer transfer. That's where we're trying to negotiate dates. No question, 180 days old, it's supposed to come to us. I agree. Well, it, it appears that maybe we should just take a common sense approach. Instead of having all the computer systems set up and looking at all the debt, if I were you, I'd be fo focusing at the new debt, the 180-day-old debt. I'd have send it over to me so at least we can send it out on a treasury, one mailing on treasury. I talked to one of the people who used to work for you, and they told me just by sending out a letter on treasury uh, stationery, you, you got something, a huge response back. But you're not going to even be able to do that if you can't even get it moved over to Treasury. And we're having a problem moving it over. And instead of trying to solve the whole problem, if you just concentrated on the new debt, you might have more success in, in uh, responding to uh, bringing it in and, and responding in, in to being successful. You know, I wouldn't worry about the computer systems and all of the programs. I'd say, send me your 180-day-old debt. And I think you will see, since we had a gain-sharing provision, that those agencies that were successful in bringing money in were able to keep part of the money, which is, makes sense. Reward them for their effort. I think if you impose the 180-day deadline, you'd see much more of an effort by the agencies to bring that debt in, as opposed to, see, I, I just don't understand why it's so complicated. And maybe we ought to approach it like we did the health plan, instead of trying to solve everything at once. Take one aspect of it and implement it. If you could just get them to refer the debt to you within 180 days, so you could send out one letter. I bet you a lunch on, uh, in any restaurant of your, co of your choice, any uh, continent of your choice, I'm so confident of winning this bet, <laughs> that if you just get them to send you the debt that's 180 days old and send out one letter, I'm not even talking about a phone call, one letter, I think that this 2.5 million is going to be more near 5 or 10 million. But how, how do you expect it to succeed if, you, if, you, if, you compute, if you're going to just create computer systems and double check them with everything else, uh, you, you're never going to get anywhere. You, you definitely have hit on the key for success is to promptly get all the debts when they turn 180 days old into a central place to be worked on, because that is truly going to be the measure of then success. Then why don't you just call up the agencies and say, send it over. It's easy. You're treasury. I can make the call. I, I can't promise you it'll turn around overnight. But uh, we but, intend to bring in all the agencies and ask them why they're not sending it over. Uh, but we're told that you're not even asking for it. You're, you're asking for other things. You know, what's your computer system like? You're asking everything except for, send me the debt. I'm trying to make you look like uh, the, the heroes and heroines of government. You have a wonderful program in front of you. You're not going to tax anybody. You're not going to hurt anybody. You're only going to bring additional money into the Treasury that is owed the taxpayers, that is owed the citizens of this country, so that we can help more students, so that we can help more farmers. It's a wonderful, exciting program. And, uh, and I don't understand why you're not making it a top priority. And I, I would like to respectfully ask a, a listing of who's working on it, how much personnel, how much from uh, the reserve, how much from the central control board, and, and uh, treasury, which is usually the star in government. You're usually the ones who are the best and the brightest, and you get things done faster. And, and uh, I just don't understand why this simple project. I truly do believe, Mr. Hawk, if I went over and ran this program for you, you would you would see your uh, you'd see billions coming in. It's not that hard. It's not that hard if you look at it and focus on it. Anyway, I was told that you did have a, a program in place uh, that uh, that included radio, TV spots, print media, to to publicize the debt collection improvement act. And and then I found that someone pulled the plug. I think uh, 
Some of these successful doctors that aren't paying back their student loans, they'd pay up immediately if they felt there was going to be pressures. And I mean people who can afford to pay back their loans. I'm not talking about people who are still struggling. But why did you pull the plug on advertising and making people aware of this program that's going to help citizens? I don't believe we pulled the plug. Uh, we did reassess the timing to get the biggest uh, payback on reassess this. Reassess the timing? That's pulling the plug. I mean, I'm not asking for a big payback. I'm asking for a minor payback, something more than $2.5 million. I mean, are you taking the bet now with me on our, on our lunch? In the this restaurant of your choice, on the continent of your choice. Mrs. Maloney, if we could get you detailed over to Treasury for a couple of months, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd be willing to take that bet. <laughs> okay. Now, um, so you're going to move forward with this advertising campaign, Mr. Murphy? When? We're deferring the advertising campaign to coincide with when we'll have the more robust capability to, to show that we're actually you know, offsetting more payments. Uh, to do it prematurely and not really have, you know, the full capability seem to be, uh, you know, probably not a wise use of those resources. So it's been deferred and will be, you know, reassessed as to the timing. Let, 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 me, let me just add to that. Uh, we, we haven't pulled the plug on this, uh, uh, on this at all. I, I, I want to stress again that, that the, we understand and are tremendously sympathetic with the sense of frustration that the uh, members of the committee have shown uh, in this regard. Our progress has not been what anybody uh, would want. On the other hand, this is a program that's going to be in existence for a long, long time. Uh, and, and it holds out the promise over time of, of uh, being of great benefit to American taxpayers. It, it's exceedingly important that this, that this be done right, that the, that the education and advertising campaign uh, be, be such that it doesn't create uh, adverse reaction in the public and erode the support for the program. We've seen in the context of, of the Internal Revenue Service uh, what can happen when, when public confidence in, uh, in, a, in a program is, uh, is eroded. We don't want that to happen uh, for all the reasons that I think uh, are, are clear. And to launch out on a program before we've got uh, uh, the computer systems adequately integrated and tested uh, to, to run the risk of, of duplication or uh, of, uh, uh, of, of collection efforts uh, really threatens to undermine support uh, for the program. We want to get it done right, uh, and we're going we're to put uh, the resources to work that are, that are needed to, to get it done right. Very respectfully, I'm, I'm not even talking about the computer system now. I'm just talking about <coughs> having debt that's 180 days old, referred to Treasury and getting one letter out, just one, and I'm betting it'll go to 10 million. And I just would respectfully like to ask Mr. Murphy if he could send a letter to all the agencies and ask them to refer their debt within 180 days and then send one Treasury letter out, and I think that this will jump to 10 million pretty fast. And uh, you've got all these reasons why that I don't agree with, what, that you have to put off all these other systems, et cetera, et cetera. Fine, but let's just move it over and comply with that one aspect of the law now. That's all I'm saying. My time is up. I thank the uh, gentlewoman from New York. Uh, we, uh, I intend to give her a letter by the end of business today to co-sign to the president to say, hey, how about an executive order in this area and let's move ahead. I might add Ms. Maloney's had some very good training in this area. She was a member of the New York City Council. And actually, she's in great good humor today. You should have seen what she did on the New York City Council to get debts collected. <laughs> and that's a lot tougher town than this town. So uh, I know who I'm going to recommend to the president should Mr. Rubin ever decide to do something else, because she also sits on the banking committee, and she's got a lot of good experience. Mr. Davis, do you have some questions you'd yes, like to ask? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Murphy, does Treasury have the responsibility and the resources to assist other agencies to develop their debt collection centers or debt collection programs? Uh, we have been providing what assistance we can, uh, both in terms of written guidance and, and tr conferences and training conferences. Uh, 
but we don't really have the resources to build both our systems and theirs. Um, I mean, we are spread pretty thin, and we've got a lot on our plate. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to be making any new commitments in terms of systems developments uh, outside the ones we already have. I guess what I was hoping was that you had a way of reviewing or suggesting to them that perhaps you've got more experience than they do, you've had more contact, uh, you've had more interaction with the process and may have developed some nuances or expertise along the line that they could benefit from which would help them in the early stages which would, would prevent perhaps as many accounts reaching the 180 days as, as is currently yes. happening. Uh, you know, we, we try to share best practices, and, uh, you know, Treasury has developed many of the tools, and, uh, you know, we've tried to uh, share those with agencies and to provide training on how to use those. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, you know, some of the agencies have more experience than we do in certain areas, and they're out there, you know, they've been out there trying to collect this debt for quite a while, and they have developed some some good practices as well which they have tried to share with others so we are trying to to learn from one another as to what works and what works best i know that we have not been or it does not appear as though we've been as aggressive as as perhaps we can be and perhaps we ought to be but have you been receiving and and, and what kind of complaints have you gotten from individuals in terms of people who may have felt that they've been unduly put upon? The actual debtors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the non-tax debt area, um, I'm not really personally aware of, you know, any specific cases. I'm, I'm sure, you know, there may have been some. But, you know, we have really tried to go through a due process procedure where people are given notices in advance and sometimes second notices in advance before we even, you know, make a referral. Uh, and so we, we've tried to address that concern as best we can. Could you check and see if we've got some? And if so, I'd just be interested to know what kind of complaints uh, we get and, and, and how people feel about what we're doing in terms of the methods that are used. And, and finally, what happens if we discover, for example, that we're getting a large number of complaints uh, on some of the contractors or companies that we've engaged? Let's say down the line we discover or people started complaining that company X is doing whatever that's not in compliance or not the intent of the protections that were built in. What happens then? Uh, I think the contractor would probably be removed. Uh, FMS will be doing, you know, some oversight of the 10 contractors under our new private collection agency contract. Uh, you know, we'll be assessing their performance uh, and to the extent that complaints come in, those would have to be addressed. Uh, and if a contractor is violating, you know, the terms of the agreement, uh, they could be potentially removed. I'm very pleased to note that because even though I think we must do everything humanly possible to try and collect the monies that are owed, I think we also have to make sure to the best of our ability that we not violate the rights of individuals as we pursue that. And so I appreciate the, that component. And the last thing I'd probably say on this is, Representative Maloney, when you win the bet. Make sure it's disclosed on your financial disclosure <laughs> statements. <laughs> Ms. Maloney has a short question for Under Secretary Hawk. I, I would just follow, like to follow up with Mr. Hawk's uh, statement that if I was de a detailee in Treasury, we would bring the money in. I would like to offer if, if Mr. Hawk would give us one detailee from Treasury who's worked in debt collection to work with us on our committee, I believe we can bring that money in. Now, we'd have to interview that person to make sure they're committed 
and hardworking and, and uh, you know, uh, passionate about uh, helping the taxpayers. But uh, I, I truly do believe that, and I'd like you to respectfully consider um, if this committee could have a detailee, just one, out of Treasury. I firmly believe that we can improve this dramatically. Mrs. Molly, we, we will work as closely as possible with the committee in trying to accomplish uh, our mutual objectives here. Well, we thank you, and uh, Mr. Murphy has the responsibility for implementing this program, I assume. Is that correct, Under Secretary? Mr. Murphy uh, uh, presides over the Financial Management Service, and, and uh, he's got, as he mentioned before, a member of his staff who is now stationed down there, uh, personally overseeing the program. Okay. I, I think what you've heard here this morning, uh, some of us say it in a very quiet way, others say it a little less quiet. The point is the same. At our six-month hearing, starting from this day, we expect substantial results. You look at that chart over there, the lost potential of the Treasury offset program, the question is not simply going up from the bottom in terms of the total debts. That's, that's fine. But to get that box also moving across on the payments as uh, well as the uh, debts, and uh, here we have 43 million has been collected. The total payment volume is 856 million. And that dark side of the box in that little teeny weeny corner of reflecting the 39.5 billion, uh, that, that box boils down to 8.9 billion. And we collected 43 million as I look at that. And we need to come across and to be going up on that particular chart within the six month point. Mr. Chairman, th those are, uh, I believe, numbers of. Uh, uh, numbers of payments uh, along the, the, the bottom access there. That's and I right. think, I think uh, one of the things we'd like to do is to work with the committee to, to get an appropriate set of benchmarks. That 856 million payments uh, isn't really a realistic uh, target for the number of payments that are effectively subject to uh, offset. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, there are means testing uh, in, in, in a number of these programs. Uh, Social Security payments are only can be offset uh, to the extent of 15 percent above $750 uh, a month. So looking at a total of $856 million uh, in payments isn't necessarily the right, uh, uh, the right uh, number to be looking at. But we would, we would like to work with you to, to come up with a, a set of standards that is, is meaningful and, and will, will adequately uh, uh, properly measure progress against uh, uh, where we are now. Well, we thank you. Ms. Maloney has a comment to make on this. I, I, we can go back and forth, but I, I just uh, know that we asked for, for uh, standards and guidelines in our September letter, and, and I, I think this clearly shows, you know, 2.5 million, the two major components not implemented at all, and all of this revenue out there. So I, I thank uh, both of you for testifying, and, and I look forward to working with you. And, and I truly am sincere, uh, Mr. Hawk. I feel if I had a good Treasury uh, detailee working with the subcommittee, we could bring this money in. I really believe that. Well, we thank you for coming. And we look forward to uh, more optimistic results uh, and delivery of results in what we're stressing as a performance results-oriented government at the six-month mark. So uh, hopefully that will be expedited. The lawyers will be doing their de good deeds on writing regulations and the other agencies will be implementing. And what we're going to do now, and we thank you, is to merge panels two and three with the four agency witnesses and go right down the line there. We should be out of here by uh, 1 o'clock, I would think. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, Deputy Administrator Gray, Assistant Secretary Longnicker, Chief Financial Officer Keevy, Acting Deputy Commissioner Sopper, come forward.
we have Mr. Gray and Mr. Pesca. Could you identify yourself for the record? M Mr. Pesca, can you identify yourself for the record? Thomas Pesca, Director of Debt Collection Service, Department of Education. Okay. And then we have Secretary Longnecker, Mr. Keevy, and Mr. Sopper. Gentlemen, I think you know the routine. If you'll rise, raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Clerk will note that all five witnesses have affirmed, and what we'll do is just take the order in which they are on the agenda. We'll start with uh, John Gray, Deputy Administrator of the Small Business Administration. We've read your statement. We don't want it read to us. It's filed automatically once we introduce you. We want you to look us in the eye and tell us the summary of your statement and where you are and where you're headed in this area. So, Mr. Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is John Gray, and yes. I am the Associate Deputy Administrator for Economic Development at the Small Business Administration. <coughs> I'm responsible for providing overall direction for the SBA's credit programs and the portfolio management. I've been in this position since late July, um, coming from a career in the banking industry. I believe this is the first time that the SBA has been asked to appear before this committee, and I am pleased to provide testimony on SBA's implementation of the Debt Collection Improvement Act, including our efforts to undertake and implement a loan asset sales program. Um, in the interest of time, I will not address each part of the Act. Instead, I will summarize SBA's implementation <coughs> under three key areas. The referral of delinquent debt, the designation of the SBA as a debt collection center, and asset sales. Um, but to start with, I would like to provide this committee with some background information on SBA's programs and debt collection capabilities. The SBA provides assistance to America's small businesses and entrepreneurs through a whole spectrum of technical assistance and micro lending to business and real estate loans as well as venture capital investing. SBA has moved from direct lending to small businesses to guaranteeing debt that is incurred by financial intermediaries, both regulated and non-regulated institutions. Additionally, the SBA serves as America's disaster bank. As of September 30th, 1997, the total investment under SBA's financial assistance program amounted to $38 billion. Total guarantees are valued at $29 billion, and total outstanding loans serviced by the SBA exceeds $9 billion. The SBA is moving rapidly into the 21st century, both in organizational structure and in the role of oversight of our financial intermediaries. Debt and investment are originated by a third party, monitored and reviewed by the SBA, and serviced and collected by third parties. The only exception to this is the SBA's origination of disaster home and business loans, which remains direct to individuals, businesses, and communities harmed by natural disasters. Working with our financial intermediaries, <coughs> the SBA lending program volume has increased by 65% between 1992 and 1997, and our staff levels have decreased by 34% during the same time period. Not only is that contrast indicative of the change in environment for the SBA, but credit quality, as measured by currency rate and loan losses, have improved. In fiscal year 97, SBA had an increase in cash collections of over 50% fiscal year 93-95, while averages uh, average, while having purchases, which is the SBA default rate, has decreased 4.38% in the same time period. These results were achieved through our liquidation improvement project and intensive effort between our field offices and our lending partners, which are managed by the SBA. Even though I believe that the SBA has done and is doing a very credible job managing its credit exposure, SBA must rely more on programs such as asset sales, cross-servicing, and the Treasury offset program. Specifically for cross-servicing, the DCIA provides that delinquent debt over 180 days be transferred to Treasury for debt collection purposes and for participation in administrative offset. The SBA has prepared the letter agreement to Treasury for the purpose of initiating cross-servicing. Under this agreement, SBA will prefer to Treasury all accounts 
which SBA has completed necessary foreclosure or litigation proceedings and which have a deficient balance remaining. In addition, SBA will promptly refer all loans at 180 days delinquency or sooner, which cannot be effectively collected through foreclosure on collateral or litigation against obligors. SBA has identified approximately $700 million in debt that can be referred as soon as procedural details and system requirements are worked out, and we anticipate that that will happen by the middle of December. In terms of the tre Treasury Administrative Offset Program, we will refer to Treasury all delinquent accounts which are not being actively pursued through litigation of collateral or litigation proceedings. Accounts which initially have been included for top are 22,000 accounts with indebtedness totaling $570 million. Holders of these accounts were notified in mid-October that their loans are candidates for offset. We anticipate that these accounts will be referred in December of 97 or early January 1998. The DCIA envisions that a number of federal agencies should be designated as collection centers for their own debt as well as that of other agencies. SBA firmly believes that it should be designated as a debt collection center because of well-established experience in its loan collection activities. On October 30th, 1997, SBA sent a proposal to Treasury requesting designation of a debt collection center. A copy of that letter is attached to the written testimony, and I will make no further comments on that. Asset sales. The administration's fiscal year 1998 budget proposed the sale of all SBA-held business loan assets, including direct business loans and guaranteed business loans that have defaulted and subsequently purchased by the SBA, as well as all direct disaster loans over the period fiscal year 1998-2000. The total portfolio of these loans is estimated about $9 billion last year. Additionally, it is estimated that an additional billion dollars over the next several years will be added for a pot potential loan asset sale program in excess of $10 billion. In keeping with this budget proposal, SBA has begun to develop an asset sales program. We will seek to use an asset sales as another management tool to take advantage of private sector expertise, minimize the cost of programs to the taxpayer, and still preserve the public policy objectives of the SBA. <coughs> SBA has been working towards the development of a plan and strategy to accomplish these sales in connection with the Office of Management and Budget and the Federal Credit Policy Working Group. I'm pleased to report that we've completed our draft strategic plan. It has been improved internally. Um, and it, at, it outlines the essential resources that we need and key steps to be taken by us. We've also completed a preparation of statements of work to engage all necessary outside financial and technical advisors. It cannot be stressed strongly enough that SBA is aware of its unique relationship to small business owners and to disaster vi victims who receive our loans. The SBA has and will continue to move cautiously so that public policy issues are adequately and appropriately addressed in order to ensure that small business constituents are not harmed, especially those who have suffered loss due to natural disasters. We will also need to work with our lending community and other stakeholders on our asset sales initiative in order to assure success. This is a particularly important area because many of our financial intermediaries liquidate our collateral and collect our debts uh, with prior approval of the SBA, and they retain an ownership position in our assets. In summary, Mr. Chairman, we believe that SBA is on track to accomplish all key requirements of the DCIA. We are dedicating resources to implement the legislation. We are working with Treasury and others to ensure that it is put into effect in a manner that makes sense and is in the best interest of small businesses that we serve. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, we will uh, withhold questions till we hear from all the witnesses. I take it, Mr. Longnecker, you're the principal uh, respondent, and Mr. Pesk is going to help me out. That's help right. you out. Okay. That's right. I hear you're a very distinguished career servant, Mr. Pesk, and you've been doing this for a long time. Maybe we can get a lot of lessons for other agencies from you somewhere this morning. Go ahead, Sec right. Secretary Longnecker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm David Longnecker. I'm the Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education at the Department of Education, and I'm joined today by Tom Pesca, who's the Director of our Debt Collection Service. Um, it's a distinct pleasure to be before this committee today. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity uh, to discuss with you the department of uh, the success in the department with implementing the Debt Collection Improvement Act 
and to discuss some of our ideas for the future uh, with you as well. As you know, the Department of Education is the primary source of student loans in this country. Uh, this year, through our various programs, students and their parents will borrow more than $30 billion. Uh, since the inception of our three basic student loan programs, those are the, uh, the original program we now call the Perkins Student Loan Program, the old uh, Federal Family of Educational Loan Program, and uh, our wonderful new uh, Direct Student Loan Program. Uh, between those three programs uh, since the inception, we have made $285 billion worth of student loans. $184 billion of that remains outstanding, with $91 billion of that in repayment, $68 billion still with students who are enrolled in school and thus not yet in repayment on their student loans, and about $25 billion in default. I might mention that since its inception just three years ago in 1994, the direct loan program has already made $20 billion worth of loans. The Department has been making concerted efforts to reduce the student loan default rate with substantial success. Over the five years preceding this last year, the default rate was reduced from 22.4 percent to 10.7 percent. And later today, the Secretary will be announcing that for the sixth year in a row, that rate has gone down, uh, this time slightly. Uh, credit for that substantial reduction must be shared broadly. You in Congress deserve much of the credit because of the uh, two major pieces of legislation, the credit reform uh, piece in 19, I believe it was 1989, and the amendments of 1992, which have given us the tools necessary uh, to uh, improve our collections. Our partners in the FFEL program, uh, particularly the guarantee agencies, have done a very good job of improving their collection on debt, and the Department, through its oversight of institutions, lenders, and guarantors, and most significantly, through the Debt Collection Service has really improved uh, our performance. As you know, student loans are inherently risky because the only collateral behind them is the mine being developed. Uh, we're working with borrowers who are generally unsophisticated in debt management, many of whom are academically at risk as well as being financially at risk. So some will default. When they do default, it's our Debt Collection Service, with Tom Pet which Tom Pesca heads, uh, that works to collect on those defaults. <coughs> and we ha work very hard at that. Indeed, we've implemented many of the debt collection mechanisms that the Debt uh, Collection Man Improvement Act calls for. And indeed, it works. Over the past six years, the Department has collected almost $4.5 billion in defaulted loans, $3.2 billion of which has come through our partnership with the IRS, uh, through the IRS offset of tax refunds, including a half a billion dollars this past year, 1997. And we understand, I think we're the, uh, we've referred more accounts to Treasury uh, than any other agency. We've also been quite successful <laughs> in using private collection agencies, which have been part of our history since 1979. Over the past six years, our private vendors have collected uh, $766 million, and our private-public partnership is uh, recognized as a model uh, for others to follow. Through the Federal Salary Offset Program, we've collected $33 million over the past five years from federal employees who are in default on their student loans. And though we can't really document the dollar amounts, there are some other things that we've done which have also helped. Uh, we believe that our reporting of delinquent student loan debt to credit bureaus helps. The use of electronic payments, 91 percent of our payments are done electronically, helps. And our requirements that student loan borrowers provide their taxpayer identification numbers when applying for a loan, which we've had uh, for some time, also helps to reduce defaults. Five years ago, we began administrative wage garnishment. And today, we are garnishing the wages of over 53,000 borrowers. We've collected 34 million via wage garnishment since 1992, and we expect that amount to grow as we develop better tools for wage garnishment in the future. And indeed, with reauthorization of the higher education coming up, after coming up, we might be back to talk to you about how you can help a little more in that regard. We've also reduced defaults for preventing loan, uh, loans to de uh, prior defaulters. With the development of the <coughs> National Student Loan Database, we've identified potentially uh, $850 million worth of loans, uh, potential loans to students who were in default, uh, who were requesting another loan. And so we've been able to prevent them from borrowing, clearly reducing uh, the logical default on those. We're also working with Treasury in, a in various ways, including a new joint venture which we began in July with Treasury's FMS to examine whether FMS would be an effective partner in the collection of defaulted student loans. Uh, in fact, we, we would like to expand our work with FMS through 
uh, the use of the new enhanced treasury offset program. So we bring pretty good news to you here today uh, on the collection of defaulted student loans, but we're not satisfied with what we've done. Uh, we're considering initiatives to create some new collection tools, and we will be including these new ideas as part of our reauthorization of the Higher Education Act proposals. But th these haven't been vetted throughout the administration, so it would be inappropriate to share them in detail with you at this point, but we will want to work with you as, as, we've been able to, as we're able to do that. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you the progress we've made in, improve, uh, in improving debt collection in the department and our plans for the future. Uh, as requested, we've also included on our testimony the debt performance indicators that you requested. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we thank you for your testimony and we thank you for the very good written statement you presented us with. Uh, Richard Keevey is the Chief Financial Officer of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Welcome, Mr. Keevey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Davis. Uh, I thought what I would do is just summarize for you what I think are the six major points that are covered in my rather lengthy testimony. One, the uh, current outstanding uh, debt for HUD is $2.2 billion. That's a decrease of uh, $443 million from the prior year. Uh, of that amount, $1.7 billion relates to FHA defaulted loans, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a second. That's the Federal Housing Administration, not yes. the Federal Farm Home That's loan. right, Mr. Chairman. Secondly, we do fully use the offset program, and we have referred about $135 million worth of debt to the Treasury, and that represents the majority of the debt that can be referred to the Department of Treasury. Third, we are interested in uh, cross-servicing. You mentioned earlier we do have a proposal that we are uh, airing out with Treasury Department that would transfer one of our centers, which is presently located in Seattle, over to the Department of Treasury. The staff there are expert, particularly in the Title I recovery area. Almost all of our other debt we have consolidated and will move to the Albany site. The remaining debt that is there at uh, Seattle, we are proposing that we would transfer, first on a pilot basis, all of the remaining debt plus the staff to Treasury and at the end of that year, evaluate how effective it would be. Uh, Treasury is reviewing this at the moment. Fourth, I want to make the point that of the uh, $2.2 billion of uh, remaining debt, $300 million relates to uh, mortgage-backed securities by the Ginnie Mae operation, and that will be recovered through FHA insured or VA guarantees. So that will be an internal offset procedure that we, will, that we are currently executing. Fifth, we do have a very active uh, sale of assets program, particularly as it has to do with the FHA. Over the past few years, we have sold over 115,000 defaulted loans with a gross pre proceeds of $7.5 billion. And the remaining amount that uh, yet to be done will be part of a future sale uh, that we hope to execute uh, uh, within a reasonable period of time. Uh, Final point I'd like to make is that HUD does fully use the Credit Alert Interactive Voice Response System, and that is a free screening tool to bar individuals who owe the government money from getting new loans. It's a system that was pioneered by HUD uh, several years ago and is uh, available to all federal agencies. So in summary, I'd like to say that we are, in, I believe, in substantial compliance with the Act, and we have several uh, very active programs underway, particularly the uh, a sale of assets as has to do with FHA and the active pursuit of cross-servicing with Treasury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you. Uh, again, that was a very thorough statement. We'll have some questions when we uh, get to that. Our last uh, witness is Dale Sopper, the Acting Deputy Commissioner, Social Security Administration. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Maloney, Mr. Davis, uh, I'd like to summarize my remarks and ask that my prepared statement be included <coughs> in the hearing record. It's automatic. Uh, attached to my statement for the record also is the chart you requested on debt performance indicators. Last year, the Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996 provided the Social Security Administration with two new debt collection tools which had been available to other federal agencies since 1982. That is, SSA is authorized to charge interest on overpayments and offset against federal salaries in cases in which the Social Security overpayment was made to an individual over the age of 18 at the time the overpayment occurred, 
and the overpayment had been determined to be otherwise unrecoverable. These new tools, when implemented, will put SSA on an equal footing with other government agencies. Beginning in January 1998, SSA will participate in the Treasury Offset Program, which will offset an individual's debt against most payments issued by the Treasury Department. Also in January 1998, SSA will begin referring information about debtors' delinquencies to consumer credit reporting agencies. These new authorities will be used only to recover OASDI debts, that is, old age survivors and disability insurance debts, since there is no statutory authority to do so for <coughs> debts which are incurred by recipients of supplemental security income payments. We plan to improve collection of supplemental security income debts by expanding the use of the tax refund offset program for which there is no statutory exclusion. We anticipate that the combination of these new collection tools will increase SSA's debt collections by 10 to 20 million dollars six million dollars of which we expect to come from the expansion of the tax refund offset program to the supplemental security income program debt. In your invitation to testify, you requested information on the status of regulations necessary to implement the Debt Collection Improvement Act. We are about to publish regulations that will govern the use of administrative offset and the use of consumer credit reporting agencies for OASDI debts as well as revised regulations for the Old Age and Survivors Disability Insurance Tax Refund Offset Program that address the conversion of the program from the Internal Revenue Service to the Financial Management Service. Specific provisions of the Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996 allow for the offset of old age survivors and disability insurance payments to recover debts owed to other federal agencies. We are ready to work with the Treasury Department to implement this provision and are in the process of reviewing draft regulations that will put this provision into effect. We are working with Treasury to ensure effective data exchange between agencies so that we are able to respond to inquiries that result from such offset. Another provision of the Debt Collection Improvement Act calls for referral of <laughs> debts to the Treasury Department for cross-servicing. That is, the Treasury Department acts as a debt collector for the agency. Debts are exempt from this provision if the debts have been referred to a debt collection center. We have submitted an application to the Secretary of the Treasury to be designated as a debt collection center for the purpose of collecting our own debts. We base this application on the existing debt collection centers that we have in place since 1984 for recouping the debt that cannot be recovered through benefit offset. These centers use all of the techniques available to us. Therefore, at this point, we have not referred any debts for cross-servicing. In conclusion, I would like to restate SSA's commitment to debt management and the implementation of the Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996. The success of our debt management program is critical to the Social Security Administration's mission and to our goal to make SSA's program management the best in business. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, we appreciate your coming. Uh, we have a high regard here for the administration of the Social Security Administration that's 35 years standing, I would think. Uh, let me start just down the line with the Deputy Administrator of SBA, Small Business Administration. Based on the latest information we have from the Financial Management Service and the Treasury, SBA has not referred any delinquent debt for administrative offset. But SBA's chart provided to the committee with your testimony lists 218 million as being referred. Could you uh, explain to me what the gap is between FMS? Is the check in the mail or the debts in the mail? What do we got here? It's the IRS offset, I was just informed. The IRS offset, uh, offset. offset not the FMS then? Correct. Okay. Well, that creates some of the uh, untangles it. Your testimony noted that SBA will refer seven million, seven hundred million dollars for collection action to Treasury at the end of the year. And in May, the, your administrator, Alvarez, sent Ms. Maloney and I a letter promising to begin referrals in June of 97. Now, obviously, that didn't occur, or did it? It did not occur. Uh, yeah. And I realize you weren't around in June. You're new at the job. Uh, are you now responsible for ensuring that the referrals do operate on schedule? 
Is that part of your portfolio as yes, deputy? Yes, it is, and I am comfortable making that commitment today. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, would authority to administratively offset federal payments and garnish wages increase the marketability of your federal loan portfolio? Your testimony says you're a recovering banker, so uh, I assume you might have a few opinions on that. Um, yes, I believe it will. One of the issues that we are trying to address internally is to make sure that the information provided to Treasury is adequate and thorough, and that would stand uh, as well to provide to anybody who would be purchasing um, these loans from us. And coming from the private sector, it's really the information that creates the value for those assets, and we're working very diligently on that. Uh, do you feel then that bankers who purchase those loans would want such tools and be willing to pay a premium for them? If there were a history where you could show that there really was a return, the answer is absolutely yes. Do we have that history anywhere? Not yet. You're going to provide it? How about your neighbor next door here, education? Have, I'll have defer they proved it, that it works? Well, we've had uh, pretty substantial success in collection on defaulted student loans, but we've still found uh, uh, much reluctance in the studies we've done in the past about whether we could actually uh, market those as a as an asset, um. uh, Mr. Gray. As I understand it, and you probably weren't around when they formulated this, but maybe you've had a chance to look at it. Members of Congress on the authorizing committee, the appropriations subcommittees, and our own investigating committees on oversight have been reviewing the various strategic plans agencies have submitted. And the strategic plan for the Small Business Administration lists five general goals. The goal closest to debt collection is, quote, transform SBA into a 21st century leading edge financial institution, unquote. If debt collection is not a chief focus of the agency, you may find that partnering with the Financial Management Service in Treasury is an attractive option to have another agency whose principal focus is debt collection perform this function. If you were here this morning, I think a lot of us agreed that the obvious, that when you're trying to serve a certain number of clientele in a segment of our economy, you serve small business, agriculture, service farmers, on and on, it might be best if you let somebody else collect the <coughs> debt and you'll still be the nice guys and gals and uh, you let them worry about you know, collecting it. What's SBA's feelings on this? There are really two kinds of debt for us. One is the debt that is um, made to a small business or an entrepreneur or a victim of disaster where their ability to repay the agency is um, compromised by a period of time, i.e. after disaster they have a tough time paying us back. That kind of debt we have the ability within the agency to defer repayment for a period of time, the same with small businesses. At some point, the debt becomes, um, it's clear that you can't defer it, you can't work it out, the small business doesn't have that ability, and at that point it has to refer directly um, to either a debt coll collection agency or to the Treasury. Because we do have a real public purpose there, we are trying to make sure that our systems are clear about who we're with whom we're working, and the, and the purpose of that. I think that internally we recognize that and we can manage that. Uh, Mr. Keevy, let me turn to HUD on delinquent debt. Uh, much of that uh, 1.8 billion that is noted is reported as exempt from cross-servicing because it's scheduled for sale, as I understand it. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chief. Uh, what does this debt consist of and what is the status of those pending sales? They consist mostly of FHA single-family and multi-family defaulted loans. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we have been have, we had a very, have a very active program. Uh, we have uh, uh, received gross proceeds of over seven and a half billion dollars. The program has been temporarily suspended because of problems with the financial advisor. Uh, there is in the intent to renew this program once that uh, issue is uh, straightened out. And it is the intent of the department to sell the remaining uh, single-family and multi-family debt. Uh, is it going to be referred for administrative offset, any of that debt? No, sir. 
Uh, why I not? I think this is the most effective way of dealing with the debt. We have an ongoing viable program where this debt can be sold, and uh, we think this is the way to do it, Mr. Chairman. What's been the history in terms of the percent of your debt that you've actually collected, and what's the markdown, in essence, once you get through with the process? With the FHA, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think the numbers that, uh, that we had was uh, $9.5 billion uh, was written down to $7.5 billion through the sales process. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I notice on, uh, I guess it would be page 10 of your 11-page statement, that you say we have completed the preparation of statements of work to engage outside financial and technical advisors, including. Now, you just sort of referred to that. Uh, how many advisors are we talking about, and is that a real block in your collection efforts? Where are you reading, Mr. Chairman? Well, maybe I've got the wrong one. That might be SBA. I'm sorry, because uh, I thought I'd mark the same thing for you. That's the next one. How about it, Mr. Gray? Uh, when I've been looking at your selection or desire to get program financial advisors, transactional financial advisors, due diligence advisors, legal services advisors, <coughs> all that. Are they not in place at SBA? They are not in place. Yeah. And so this would be a new effort? That's correct. Okay. Right. How difficult is it to get these? Are you simply going out on the private market and hiring them or what? Well, we have two efforts undergoing right now. One is an internal SBA procurement through the traditional and I believe very well run procurement system at the SBA. The other is we are working with both um, Treasury and HUD on a GSA schedule, and we hope to have that in place um, the next 12 months or so. Okay. On uh, Social Security, uh, <coughs> I notice on uh, page 5, uh, you note that the, uh, another provision of our legislation called for referral of debts to the Treasury Department for cross-servicing and uh, the Treasury acts as the debt collector for the agency. Uh, I'm curious, you say you've submitted an application to the Secretary of the Treasury to be designated a debt collection center for the purpose of collecting your own debts. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious as to whether you're doing as well as you should, because in a sense, from the Social Security Administration standpoint of uh, good public relations, Again, we make the point, why not just let financial management service and Treasury collect it? Why do you worry about collecting it? Why don't you just turn it over to them? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, let me say that uh, since 1981, uh, Social Security, uh, in response to uh, OMB direction, has been concerned about uh, the recovery of uh, debts owed by either uh, uh, old age and survivors, disability uh, ins uh, insurance uh, recipients, uh, or supplemental security income recipients. Uh, we currently, Mr. Chairman, uh, for individuals in benefit status, uh, collect over 90 percent of the, uh, the outstanding debt, whether that's uh, for the old age and survivors disability program or the supplemental security income program. Um, and the only reason we don't get 100 percent is because in some cases, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, uh, the collection um, is not accomplished before the uh, recipient uh, dies or uh, the uh, individual requests a waiver of the, uh, the debt. Uh, but we have an excellent record, I think, uh, in that regard. Uh, we began, as I said, in 1981 to set up our own debt collection program before uh, some of the statutory authorities that uh, your committee and the Congress has made available to us were, were even in existence. And we recognized uh, the problem that Under Secretary Hawk noted, that is the conflict between the program agency and the debt collection responsibility. And for that reason, when we set up our own debt collection centers in 1984, we placed those separate and apart from the program people who are in our field offices and dealing day to day with the beneficiaries. Uh, we, we through those uh, debt collection centers, uh, we have approximately 260 people that do that work. Uh, we, um, we use all of the tools that uh, debt collection organizations make use of uh, in terms of um, skip tracing techniques, uh, phone calls, et cetera. And um, uh, we do not, um, um, we, think, uh, we think we do a pretty good job of that, and that's why we have petitioned uh, Secretary Rubin to be exempt from this uh, overall government debt collection activity. Uh, thank you. Now yield 10 minutes to Ms. Maloney for questioning. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gray, I, I, I see from your testimony that you plan to refer $700 million to Treasury for cross-servicing and eight, $570 million for the administrative offset program by January of 98. That's great news. Do you still intend to do that? Are you yes, on? yes, we do. Okay. And how have you determined what debt to refer to Treasury and what debt not to refer to Treasury in your $1.5 billion that is uh, over 180 days uh, past due? The majority of that debt is either in litigation, foreclosure, or a deferral where there's a public purpose to work with either the small business or the individual affected. And so we have adequately addressed that debt um, or it's in litigation and we need to resolve the litigation. Um, the remaining dollars that have been um, proposed to be referred to Treasury and will be referred to Treasury are those where no greater collection efforts can be made either in litigation or in foreclosure or resolving the collateral. As, as Mr. Gray pointed out, uh, debt that is involved in litigation is exempt, yet debt that is planning to go into litigation is not exempt. Does any of those dollars have um, debt that you are planning to go into litigation on? Or um, Clearly there would be. What would happen is if you're trying to do a workout on a real estate loan, okay. before you file foreclosure, you try to make it work. work. So, so that that period of time, clearly, um, it would be in the best judgment of the lending officer or, in many cases, the, uh, the banks that are our financial intermediaries are making some of those decisions. And I understand that you have applied for to be a debt collection center in SBA and, and to centralize debt collection there. And are you aware, are, or are you ready to take debt from other agencies and, and process it if you are, in fact, a, a debt collection center? The answer is yes. And I read in your testimony, you, you said that you have $10 billion in your loan asset program. How much of that is uh, delinquent, if any? Well, the majority of that, it's, it's 1.7 is delinquent. 1.7 billion is delinquent. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. The reason I smile at the question is the government defines delinquency and private industry defines delinquency somewhat differently. Um, if, if you were a bank, it would be greater than that because it's in deferment or you're working it out. Because the SBA has such a clear public purpose with its small businesses, mm -hmm. a lot of those loans have been rewritten or extended um, so as not to adversely affect the small mm -hmm. business. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'd like to ask uh, David Longnecker, and congratulations on your very good news that you reported today and, and the report that you put forward from your department okay. unrelated to this hearing on the, uh, the fact that your delinquency rate is, is yet lower uh, than before. And I, I thank the Department of Education for taking the lead in referring debt to the Department of Treasury. And I gave your agency one of the highest grades in my report card, um, a, a C. <laughs> Can you tell, uh, tell me when you plan to refer the rest of your debt to Treasury for administrative offset and cross-servicing? that you had referred more and done more than yeah, any well, other I'd probably agency. come in and see if I could talk you into a B. Uh, <laughs> we think we could do better, but we think mm -hmm. we're doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. We began a, um, a, uh, a pilot with uh, Treasury in July to figure out how best uh, to collect the maximum amount. Our goal is to make sure, uh, in fact, I, it was interesting here today, I, maybe I'd be uh, mm -hmm better liked in the higher education community if I, we just gave all of the debt and didn't try so hard to collect it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, we have been very vigorous in trying to collect the debt. We want to work with FMS to find the best balance so that we are maximizing the return to the federal government I of, of I our I congratulate debt. you. You really have been a model not only in collecting debt but in, in uh, sensitive workouts with uh, students. What is your policy for write-off of, of bad debt? Do you write off bad debt after a serious Death, death and disability. Pardon uh, me? Death and disability are the only two uh, and provisions. We don't write off debt mm -hmm. at the present time. Uh, I, we I'd consider like them there. I might mention, too, mm -hmm. and I'd just like mm -hmm. to say that it's, it's nice for me as an assistant secretary to get to come and, and take the, the glory for something we do well at the department, but it's really the debt collection service, Tom Pesca and the staff that work with him that have done this. They really are a remarkable crew and, and uh, are awfully fine uh, uh, public servants. But every agency needs leadership. 
and certainly the leadership coming from the Department of Education <coughs> is reinforcing and supporting Mr. Pesca in his work. So I congratulate you on that. I'd like you to look at the two bills that I mentioned in my testimony and get back to me whether or not you support them or whether or not they would help you. One is the Debt Collection Wage Information Act, and it's uh, designed to help locate uh, student uh, debtors who move out of state to avoid uh, paying debt. It was modeled after the Massachusetts model. And the second one that I have introduced would uh, allow your agency to verify information submitted uh, to the Education Department on loan applications and other applications for federal assistance. We will do that. We'll do that in the con I mean, we're working with, um, with obviously the Office of Management and Budget mm -hmm. and with Treasury in terms mm -hmm. of trying to have a consolidated effort. So we'll do that, and we'll do that as quickly as possible in concert with our sister agencies. I, I think that uh, student loans are critically important. They're, they're part of the investment that we need to make in our future of our country, and I congratulate you for making those investments and, and handling them and managing them well so that we have money for more investments in our young people. And I thank you for your fine record. Now I'd like to go to Mr. Mr. Keevy at HUD. And HUD has $1.3 billion in delinquent debt, uh, which is over 180 days old. And in a letter that I received uh, from your department, I was told uh, that they would uh, transfer it to Treasury in four to six months, and that was over seven months ago. And uh, can you tell me where these debts are? The majority of that debt would not be under our proposal to transfer to Treasury. The large part of that debt relates to uh, uh, defaulted loan guarantees of the uh, Federal Housing Administration. And the way in which we uh, get rid of that debt, if you will, is the sale of assets. And so we you have to sell assets. Yes. And, uh, and that has been going on over the past uh, four years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have sold over 115,000 defaulted loans, mm -hmm. uh, about $7.5 billion worth. How do you sell them? Do you do them by competitive bid, yeah. advertise and competitive bid? How do you sell your assets? Yes, that's done by, uh, and I think I alluded to it in my uh, testimony, uh, a financial advisor and due diligence and all of that process that is necessary for a competitive sale. Uh, the department has put it on hold. There has been some irregularities related to the financial advisor to the department, and that is presently being, uh, the financial advisor was removed by the secretary, and the program is being looked at by the, in the inspector general mm -hmm. in terms of the process of how that was accomplished by the financial advisor. But the goals of the program remained solid and intact, mm -hmm. and it is our intent to continue that once this review is completed. I the, also uh, understand uh, Okay. from your testimony that you're working with the Department of the Treasury on, on, uh, on a pilot debt collection center. That's correct. And uh, in fact, this pilot was uh, approved by Vice President Gore as a national performance and review uh, initiative for, for designation as a reinvention laboratory. And I, I want to understand how that works. In other words, your laboratory will be an arm of the Treasury Department. Will you then turn over this collection center to the Treasury, or is it still under yeah. Our, pr our proposal is uh, we had done a review of business process re-engineering, if you will, of how we were administering debt mm -hmm. in HUD. Mm -hmm. And the lion's share of the debt that is uh, in our Seattle office is a lion's share of the debt that we would normally refer to Treasury anyway. So mm -hmm. our proposal to them was we would transfer the center and the staff over to you to administer the debt. We would do it with a pilot program for nine months to a year with the people reporting to Treasury, even though they would remain on our payroll, assuming it would all be uh, uh, a workable endeavor during that nine months, and we had every reason to expect it would be, then we would transfer the center and the people over to Treasury. That, was our, that is our proposal to Treasury. Treasury is now reviewing that, and uh, we are expecting, uh, I think, uh, a meeting later on this month to uh, hopefully uh, finalize it. From our point of view, we think it's a good thing to do. We don't need to have that center as part of uh, uh, debt collection. Uh, it would mostly be the debt that we cannot service, as contrasted to the FHA debt and as contrasted to the Ginnie Mae debt, where it makes perfectly good sense for us to handle it, either through the uh, sale of assets that I described or through the Ginnie Mae process where we get our money back from the VA or from, uh, from FHA. Well, I find the uh, proposal interesting, and it's a, certainly a new way of looking at an old problem. And 
and I congratulate you for coming up with this idea, and I hope it works. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Yield uh, 10 minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Gray, in your testimony, you noted that uh, SBA ru routinely uses uh, private collection agencies to bolster um, its efforts. Um, what has been the results of, of those uh, efforts? Measured on an economic basis, um, I know that it's under 18 percent um, cost to the agency. Um, I would have to get back to you on a detailed um, basis for that. As one agency, um, what, what are some of the problems that you've encountered or that SBA has encountered trying to implement the, the Act? It's really been a systems problem to make sure that the information that we're able to transfer to Treasury is adequate and pure so that mistakes aren't made when they go into a collection activity. It's the same problem we had in referring to our own um, outside debt collection agencies. And so once um, the systems problems are corrected or come online, then you think that there will be substantial improvement in the ability to actually collect? I am not convinced that by referring them to um, a different set of collection agencies that the performance will be improved. Um, it certainly is another way to do that. And I think we're going to monitor that and measure ourselves and, and, and measure the effort at Treasury. One of the difficulties that all the federal agencies have is understanding the true value of their debt and what really is collectible. And that's a real effort that we're trying to undertake along with Treasury. Hmm, thank you. Mr. Longenecker, it seems that the Department of Education has had reasonable and, and good success using all of the methods that you employ. What has been the experience with the private uh, agencies? Tom Peske asked if that question were asked, if he could respond to it. So I'd like to ask him to do that. Thank you. Uh, we've had excellent experience with our collection agencies. And uh, if I heard your question earlier, Mr. Davis, uh, you were concerned about uh, collection agencies being um, um, perhaps overzealous in collecting debt. Um, I've employed a couple of tools to uh, uh, guard against that. One, uh, in our contracts, we uh, have a requirement that collection agencies uh, uh, comply with the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. When we review their performance, we note any violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And all the collection agencies know me personally, the uh, 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 managers of those agencies know me personally and know that I have given uh, my personal fax number to the uh, Legal Services Corporation and if persons are having problems and they, and they have a complaint about a collection agency, they bring it to Legal Services Corporation, those complaints come directly to me. Have you had any inquiries from any of the other agencies uh, seeking information or assistance or just simply saying, well, you seem to be doing it pretty well. Can you share with us uh, your techniques? And we uh, share through the uh, Federal Credit Policy Working Group and we've had uh, uh, direct relations with the Department of Treasury mm -hmm. and uh, been able to help them out with their uh, private collection agency contracts. Thank you very much and I too would like to congratulate um, the Department of Education, it seems to me that not only have you taken an area where the loans are risky in terms of individuals who need them and acquire them, but it seems to me that you've developed an approach to trying to recoup those resources and you're doing a good job at it. Uh, Mr. Keevey, I know that, that, that HUD sells its assets in all delinquent loans and, and foreclosures. It seemed to me that there has 
been a system that always took a long period of time to do that. Uh, has there been any streamlining or expediting of that process uh, lately? Uh, I don't know the history, although I can tell you that when the active pursuit of this process was really initiated in 1994, there was a large amount of receivable on HUD's books related to these defaulted loans. And over the course of three years, we did uh, 115,000 defaulted loans. So I think uh, my looking at it tells me it's been pretty, pretty streamlined, and we have a very active program underway to do that. Um, so there may have been in the past, but I'm not aware personally that uh, the process of uh, slowness has been an impediment to the, to the program. All right. So you're satisfied that it's moving right along yes, at, at a pace that... Uh, yes, I mentioned in my testimony that it's in abeyance at the moment pending some uh, internal reviews, but once that is uh, uh, concluded, we will continue and execute the remaining portfolio that's out there. Thank you very much, and You're I welcome. have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I have a few uh, wind-up questions here. Let me ask a few specifics, and we'll get to the, uh, the wind-up. Uh, let me ask on education. Uh, as I recall here, you, without question, have the most effective debt collection program currently being operated in the federal government. And I know that took a long time to achieve, as I think all of you that have worked on it. It probably took uh, improvements over 20 years. I mentioned earlier when there was an assistant secretary uh, in the Carter administration, he was the first one I knew that really took this seriously in terms of student loans, student advising, so forth. So there's been a building on that since the late 1970s. And uh, as I look at that uh, operation, you obviously have a potential for being a real model. Yet, in terms of a core agency function, I note with interest, it's not listed in the U.S. Department of Education's seven priorities in their strategic plan. On the other hand, debt collection is a core Treasury mission with one bureau, the Financial Management Service, devoted to that function. Now, the obvious. Should the collection functions of the Department of Education and Financial Management Service be combined in any way? What's your thinking on that? Well, if that's the best way to collect student loans, we'd be uh, amenable to that, and that's why we're doing the pilot uh, to see how that goes. I actually do believe that in priority three, uh, that's where we generally try to include the debt collection service. It's where we're trying to provide the best service possible to students and to provide educational opportunity. Within that rubric is where we include the debt collection service. But more specifically to your point, our effort here is simply to assure the maximum return on this debt that is outstanding. And, uh, and we'd like to, to be a partner in that, or if we're not the most effective component, uh, we have no aversion to basically providing that to another entity uh, or finding the right partnership. Whatever works best is what we're interested in. Yeah. We have no interest in collecting other agencies' debt. Uh, we do have a lot of interest in collecting the debt uh, on students. Well, as you know, uh, agriculture with some of the financial services prides itself on running a pretty good operation. Yeah. Uh, and a number of other agencies have used yeah. their facilities. I get my paycheck from agriculture. That's okay. Fine. There's an example. Ever been late? You get it all on time, right? Usually, that's oh, right. Usually. Okay, that's a hedge there. Uh, <laughs> they don't increase the amount every month, is that it? No, they don't do that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. In a May briefing, your staff demonstrated that using relatively conservative assumptions, widespread use of wage garnishment from deadbeats who are delinquent on student loans but gainfully employed would be extremely effective. What would the challenges be in a widespread program of wage garnishment? You want to Mr. Pesca? That's a tough question. I'll ask Tom to address it. Yeah, I, I really think that we uh, need to be very mindful of the uh, privacy data that we're exchanging when we, we get into an effort like that. Everything we do is dependent on uh, the correct Social Security number. Everything we do is dependent on, and I don't want to incur the wrath of Mrs. Maloney, but I, I think systems are a key element to what we do. 
I was really pleased to hear Treasury uh, emphasize that systems are key to what we do. So we need, with such a program, we need to get the systems right so we're, we're protecting the rights of those individuals, uh, not only the ones that we're, uh, who are garnishing the wa their wages, but the others uh, who are part of those, uh, whose records are part of those data systems we're matching. Now, you haven't had any problem using the Social Security number, I take it? We, we know that some of the numbers in our system are incorrect Social Security numbers, and we are uh, having discussions currently with the Social Security Administration to uh, uh, create a program which will uh, check those numbers, and um, we might have to come back and ask for legislation when we know numbers are wrong and we do not have correct numbers, but we're not prepared to do that at this time without, without first working with the Social Security Administration. Yeah, let, me, let me ask Mr. Sopper on that. Uh, I, I know there's a concern about privacy. I heard that from the IRS Commissioner three or four years ago, and I said, you know, uh, give them the address, give them the amount they owe, put it out to private collectors, and let's see what happens and there was great worry about the use of the Social Security number. Everybody else seems to use it. Every university in America practically uses it to register students, and so it goes. So is there any problem there on the use of Social Security or interconnection to check if this person of this name at this address is, and maybe help Social Security find a lot of the phonies that are in their system when you can sell them in MacArthur Park in Los Angeles for 25 bucks and maybe a hundred people have bought that number. So uh, what do you know about that in terms of debt collection in other parts of the federal government? I assume you use it as an identifier, obviously, in your own agency. Well, yes, we do, Mr. Chairman. I'm not familiar with uh, the particular problem that uh, Mr. Gray and his, his colleagues may be having with uh, SSNs and uh, their debt collection activities. We, we. Um, and, and if, if he's talking to people in the agency, uh, you know, hopefully we can resolve for them whatever problem there is. There, we do have uh, the ability to do uh, enumeration verification uh, for um, um, the um, the employer community, and uh, if if such a a service was needed by uh, uh, SBA in connection with its debt collection activities, I'm sure we could um, arrive at some kind of a, an amicable. Uh, solution to help them out. Um, I'm just personally not aware of it. We, we do, as you know, Mr. Chairman, um, the Social Security number for, for our uh, uh, claims paying purposes is key to everything we do. Um, there, there is um, um, great sensitivity, however, um, uh, about the, the, um, the use of the number beyond its uh, stated uh, statutory purpose. Um, and uh, there are people on all sides of this issue as soon as this becomes a, a point. So um, I would, would not want to um, uh, say that uh, we ought to just use the number in any kind of a universal way for all kinds of activity. I, I think that's a very uh, a, a significant question we have to be cautious about approaching. Let me ask one general question of all of you, and let's start with Social Security. How many uh, full-time positions do you have directed at your debt collection effort? Do you happen to know that? If not, file it for the record. Um, I, I had told you earlier we have 260 people in our debt collection centers. Actually, the correct number is 239. Those are people who, who work strictly on debt uh, collection, um, uh, following up on delinquent debt. There are other people, uh, other work years in the organization that are uh, dedicated to um, uh, such things as processing waiver requests, uh, developing uh, uh, systems changes and that, and I'll have to give you an estimate of yeah. that, uh, uh, then, Mr. Chairman. Is that 239 full-time equivalents? Yes, yeah, those are work years, Mr. Chairman, 239 work years okay. that do debt collection only. Okay. Uh, how about HUD, Mr. Keevy? I don't know the total number, Mr. Chairman. Uh, people dedicated towards the FHA types of activities are yeah. 150. Are I, how many? 150. For FHA. Yes, but I should get you a, uh, Fine. a better answer. 
Uh, how about you, Mr. Lawnegger? The Debt Collection Service has 235 employees. We have uh, some uh, dedicated staff in our Office of General Counsel and our Office of Chief Financial Officer. I don't know the numbers there. And that are full-time on that. That are full-time yeah. working with us or, or dedicated. We have FTE. I, I can't think sure. of people. Why, why don't you just file them for the record? That's great. That. Well, the Department of Justice also provides us with a lot of assistance in the individual um, litigation. Full-time team over no. there? Just generally what they'd provide in the other Yeah, department. we'll try to provide some okay. estimates of that for you. Uh, Mr. Gray on SBA, small Th business. Throughout the nation in all of our 69 district offices and at central headquarters, we have an excess of 700. But remember, those were also doing workouts on all the loans, and that would also include about 125 lawyers that process foreclosures and litigation. Uh, we'll so get those are 125 on your payroll or, yes. or contract private lawyers? No, on our payroll, on I believe. On your payroll, 125 lawyers, and what roughly what on debt collection? Approximately a total of 700. 700. Yeah, you might check those. Now what I'm interested in, since we had a discussion previously with the Treasury officials, we all know if we can get out within 60 days to remind people they've got a debt, there's more likelihood of them taking it seriously and of the government collecting it to save we taxpayers a lot of money if we could not only get a surplus under what we've done in this Congress, but also get the debts that are owed. This should help a lot of things. Ms. Maloney has uh, named a whole series of things that want for help. And uh, I'll start with the $5.3 trillion national debt and infrastructure and a few other things that ought to be in there somewhere. Now, what I'm curious is how many of you give a notice at the 60-day mark or before, even earlier? We give a 10-day notice after a after delinquency, which would be um, 30 days from payment date. So if a, if a loan payment was due May 1, mm -hmm. um, on June 10th, they'd have a letter if they were delinquent as of the end of May. Okay. And have you found that's been effective, doing that 10-day notice? Oh, absolutely. What did, what did they do before that? Was it a longer number, or is this a new proposal, or has SBA always done that? We've historically had very good loan servicing, and this falls into that area. Okay. Education. What's the earliest you notify the debtor? Well, uh, uh, in that they're in default. We have, yeah. uh, ours is a little different program because our students come out of school, um, and they're in school for a while. So we have entrance and exit counseling for the students. Yeah. And then once they come out of school, they, they're in six-month deferment. But if they go into delinquency, as soon as they go into delinquency, there are various stages that the law has set up for due diligence requirements by the lenders. Then if they do go into default, uh, there's also pre-claims assistance provided by the guarantee agencies. Then the guarantee agencies do due diligence. Then it comes to Tom and his crew, and they do due diligence as well. So we're, uh, there's an awful lot of notification going out. And in the new direct student loan program, uh, we are in um, regular uh, contact with the students from the from the time, well, in fact, we're in touch with them all the way through school, and then once, if they move into delinquency status, we increase uh, our contact with them. Well, I remember having run a university that the financial aid offices mushroomed over the last 30 yes. years, when you have 25, 30 million to administer, and uh, that there was a lot of it was the financial counseling that was made to the students, so they knew, hey, this is a loan, not a grant. Right. But what is, uh, is there a different range of due diligence across the education programs? Or could you say that you certainly contact them within 60 days of the delinquency? Oh, yes. Or um, the default? Do you remember the response? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to recall the due diligence requirements in our Federal Family Education Loan Program regulations, but I believe the uh, requirement is within the first 10 days, if not sooner. Okay. And Why don't you just file the rest for the record? I'm just curious what the range is here. Uh, Mr. Keevy, in terms of HUD, how many yeah, days I does it take to get a notice out? I don't know, Mr. Chairman. The majority of the debt, as we talked about, is the FHA defaulted loans, and there's a whole process that they go through working up to the ultimate sale of the assets. So I would not be able to give you an accurate okay. answer here. I will have to get that for you. Do the best you can. Yep. And uh, Social Security? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we notify individuals immediately upon the detection of the debt, and then we give them uh, 60 days due process, which is required by statute, uh, under which they can either uh, contest the debt or request waiver. 
assuming they do not, or we begin uh, to uh, uh, exercise collection efforts. Uh, moreover, um, if we have established a repayment arrangement with someone, um, after the 31st day on which uh, there has been no activity on that, we consider that debt also delinquent. I and I would just like to add, Mr. Chairman, that to the extent that we ultimately uh, um, have to uh, terminate collection activity, uh, we continue to refer those terminated cases for 10 years to the tax refund offset program. And as you also know, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Social Security Act provides that uh, if an individual who has a debt with us in the future ever comes back on the rolls, we can use benefit offset to collect that, uh, that amount of the debt from them. On the point of benefit to offset, uh, what is the minimum that you process? Now, obviously, uh, sometimes there's been an overpayment by accident. Sometimes with that crazy earnings limitation uh, we've had, and uh, thank heavens are phasing out, uh, people uh, had their checks held up, and then uh, they had uh, outside income and all that, and I hope we're getting away from that as fast as we can. But uh, what's the minimum uh, person? I don't think we want to harm people that only get 500 a month. So where does it start? Um, the, uh, the minimum is $10, Mr. Chairman. The, the statute uh, provides that uh, initially uh, we can take all of the benefit. Uh, but as, as you know, uh, in some cases, whether it's uh, uh, a Title II uh, <coughs> beneficiary and retirement benefits or uh, uh, more likely uh, someone receiving supplemental security income, uh, the, the, uh, for them uh, to take all the benefit would impose an undue hardship on them. So $10 is the minimum that we can collect. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the median uh, for your collections in these areas? What's the median? On benefit offset, Mr. Yeah. Chairman? I'll give you that for the record okay. if that's okay. Let's have it uh, without objection. It'll go in at this point. I thank you very much for coming. Uh, we've one question before we close. I uh, would like to ask all of you the question that I asked Mr. Langsnecker earlier about your write-off policy. And I'd like to know, because uh, a lot of this debt is very old debt, do you have a policy at which point you write off old debt and just forget about it? Uh, the Board of Ed the, the Education Department said it was death and disability. I'd just like to ask your write-off policy, Mr. Gray. We write off the debt after 180 days but that doesn't mean we don't try to collect it. We just don't recognize the principal balance on our books. But when, when do you, like in our, in our report, we're, we're collecting uh, $50 billion is owed. Is there at some point where you say this is uncollectible and you just write it off completely off your books? Or do you always carry it? The principal balance is written off when we actually put it in a file and don't look at it again. I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, HUD, Mr. Keating. I would say very little of it is that we try to write off on the basis that uh, we have another mechanism to get it back on the default of loans when we go through the sale of assets. The same thing exists in the Ginnie Mae situation where we have a, another insurer to go to to get the money back, that is from the VA or uh, for those that are remaining, which is a very small part mm -hmm. of the department, uh, we normally wait 180 days and mm -hmm. then start looking at a process to uh, see whether there's an opportunity uh, or a lost opportunity to ever get the money back. And, and Mr. Sopper, when do you write off? Um, Mrs. Maloney, uh, we follow the Federal Claims Collection Standards for write-off, uh, and that is to say, uh, uh, we make write-off determinations uh, when we are unable to locate the debtor or the debtor is unable to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in terms of the write-off, you can have either a write-off due to waiver, that is the, the, uh, which, in which case the debt is forgiven forever, or we, uh, we write off because of further collection activity would no longer be effective. Uh, and as I uh, mentioned earlier to the chairman, even in those cases, where we have written off that because we have suspended collection activity, we still make use of tax refund offset and ultimately, if possible, benefit offset. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, Mr. Gray made an important point when he said that the SBA has a, a uh, policy purpose uh, that goes beyond um, collection, that of uh, building new jobs, saving jobs, um, helping to foster the economic growth of the country. And obviously the, the Board of Edu the Education Department has a, a policy purpose of investing 
and, and our young people and helping them gain an education. Would, would you share with us your, um, your due diligence policy? I mean, how do you determine, you, you, in, in other words, oftentimes young people cannot repay the debt. And I, I noticed in one of your reports, sometimes it's 10 years, even longer, before someone can repay a debt for legitimate reasons. And I wish you would share with us the balance that you use in, in helping to make these decisions that um, continue the policy of investing in education, but also the sensitivity of a person's particular personal problems or situation. Well, to the extent that it's possible, we would try to help people reconstruct their debt. And the Student Loan Reform Act of 1993 really helped us because it provided an avenue that we can provide to students now, even if they are at this point in their life uh, not able to accept a substantial debt burden, and that is the opportunity of income contingent repayment on their student loan program. Uh, through that program, we're pretty sure that that education will pay off over the next over that person's working life. And so, if they may not be able to pay a substantial amount now, but they can they can basically rehabilitate their debt. Uh, get out of default, get into repayment, be paying a fairly modest amount now, and we know that over the life of those loans, most of them will repay everything they owe. Well, I'm going to reconsider and give you a B. Thank you. <laughs> or an incomplete, as the case may be. I've appreciated all of you taking the time to do this. Now, I assume you're all involved with the, either the chief financial officer's operation and others that are, have common problems because I would hope that the success stories in the agencies, and each of you has some aspect of it that's a success story, would be shared with the other agencies, that we can get this not only from the top down in Treasury, where we felt they're a little slow, but from the grassroots coming up. I think it's tremendously important for each agency to be in the lead here, because responsibility is key in our society. And if we let people get away with deadbeats, picking the other taxpayers' pockets, like 95 percent of the taxpayers get their pockets picked, you can solve the problem. And uh, I think it's very important that uh, what your experiences have been be shared with others, and I assume you're doing that in some of the working groups that exist within the administration. Am I correct? Or is nobody even paying attention to you? Well, we are, and we thank you. And I'm going to thank the staff for uh, putting this hearing together. Uh, Russell George, the Chief Counsel, Staff Director for the Subcommittee on Government Management Information Technology. Mark Brasher, to my left, your right, Senior Policy Director in charge of this area. And he happened to nurse our little uh, loan improvement debt collection bill through the uh, Congress. John Hines, professional staff member. Andrea Miller, our clerk who we, we regret to say will be leaving us to go to Pennsylvania. And uh, we appreciated her help that we've had over the last year or so. Matthew Ebert, the uh, new clerk uh, and staff assistant. And then for the minority, the Mark Stevenson, professional staff member. And uh, Mark Guyton and Jean Gosa, the clerk for the minority. And the court reporters, Rebecca Eister and Mindy Colchico. Thank you all, and with that, this hearing's adjourned. morning, Defense Secretary William Cohen appeared on ABC's This Week. Following the program, he talked briefly with reporters about the situation in Iraq.